support to thank you i forgot to press that karen thanks for being my secretary administrative assistant i meant to say so with that um we will provide you with a certificate of participation for professional development hours not sure how you can use that perhaps as a part of your resume or, or if you need that for recertification but um or just to tell your principal that you spent five hours on a Saturday. I actually heard from Lisa Bartle in Florida to say that their teachers were going to get a trade day. So I guess they'll get, if they came today, they can get a flex time off for another professional development opportunity. So I thought that was very generous. Following this, like I said, we'll email you, we'll send you out your certificate of participation also in that will be handouts from presenters who are graciously sharing their time this morning or this afternoon, wherever you happen to be. If you aren't a member of the Health Science Educators mm -hmm. Association, we do invite you to visit healthscienceconsortium.org. So if somebody will put that in the chat, healthscienceconsortium.org. And there's a, um, there's a little tab across the top that says professional development, and there's a drop down box that talks about the Health Science Educators Association and how you can become a member of that and get some special classroom resources that um, might save your life one day right before the students are walking through the door. We do have a National Health Science Conference that we plan each year and in 2022 we'll be in Charleston, South Carolina for the October 26th through the 28th. And um, if you haven't considered coming, we encourage you to, um, to do that. There is a, a letter of um, support that you can download and fill in your information. And it can serve as your courage to ask your administration why they should invest in you and how you will be a better teacher if you come to this conference and have an opportunity to network with other health science educators across the nation. October the 26th through the 28th. And next year, 2023, will actually be in Seattle, Washington. So you can start thinking about that too. We do offer Wednesday webinars two to four times a month. And we are working to finalize the fall lineup that will be on our website as well. And we invite you to go there. If you can't attend those live, we do have those at 4.30 Eastern time. If you can't attend them live, we record them all. If I remember to do that, we do record them all and archive them on our website for you to go back and get them if you aren't able to be with us face-to-face. -face. And then lastly, we've been working diligently on a project since the spring to revise and refresh the National Health Science Standards. You'll be happy to know that the refresh is minimal and um, we've just added a few words, alphabetized things a little differently, removed some content that our business and industry decided was maybe not for current, but we did do a big outreach to healthcare industry because we feel like as health science educators, we really are working for them to give them workforce for their, for their future employers. So we did reach out to business and industry. We were so thrilled at their input and the release of those national health science standards is planned for this coming week. So there'll be a press uh, release on our website and uh, we invite you to go there and see, and we'll we'll be able you'll be able to see where the changes were, and that'll be helpful to you as you um, plan what you're going to teach for this year and maybe next year. So with that, I'm going to pass the microphone over to my friend Tony McLemore as she's going to do our first little um, seven minute blurb or so about note taking. Hello, everybody. My name is Tony McLemore. I'm the president of HSCA this year. Um, I teach at Durant High School in Durant, Oklahoma, and we are a comprehensive high school. Um, so we have I have students in grades 10, 11 and 12. 
Um, some of them are on the career tech health education pathway. Some of them just take my health science two class as an elective. So um, I kind of have a combination of students who are wanting to be health professionals and some who are just taking my um, lower class as an elective. But what I'm going to talk to you today is about interactive um, notebook guidelines. And a lot of people, when I say interactive notebooks, they think um, uh, on a computer technology, but it is not. It's paper based. I have I am a firm believer in handwriting notes. And I think that's a lost art. I think you remember things better when you write things down. So um, I have my kids do interactive notebooks. And um, when Nancy sends out your um, information, your certificate, you'll also get my guidelines that I give my students and then some examples of the reflection that I'm gonna talk about. So um, our interactive notebooks, I've done it a couple of different ways. Um, first, I started out with spiral bound notebooks. And in my health science two class, which is the first class that I teach in this pathway, um, I really want to show them how to take notes because a lot of kids don't know how to take notes. So I give them guidelines. I write on the underneath my um, document camera and it goes up on this big board behind me that you can see and they I write down what I want them to write down so on the left side of their notebook or their binder now I use binders because it's easier to stick stuff in there um, the left side of the paper is for the notes that we take during the day so the left side is what I write down on the board and what I want them to copy down OK, and um, we number each page. We have a table of contents at the beginning, and it's just as simple as the date on the left side of the, the uh, paper, um, the topic for the day. And I always write that on my board behind me. You can see um, our objectives for the day. So they write that in the topic line and then what page number it's on. So all of our pages are numbered in our notebook. Um, this is, I want them to get used to writing down stuff, uh, important information. Um, so we do that at the last five to 10 minutes of class, we do what I call a reflection. Um, at the beginning of the year, they are very, don't know what to write down. So I give them some examples. So, um, on the paper that I'm gonna, that Nancy's gonna send you, on the right side, it says the right side is the student output side. So on this side, they translate their notes that I have written down that they're supposed to write down on the left side into drawings or um, thinking maps or cartoons or different things. And so the last five to 10 minutes, basically they're doodling what we just talked about in class. And so this is also my um, exit ticket for the classroom and um, for our teacher evaluations, I can go around while they're doing their reflection and I can see if they grasped the concept for the day. Um, so they can also ask me questions if they had individual questions that maybe they didn't wanna ask in the class. Um, so those last five to 10 minutes, I think, are the most important um, minutes of the day. Um, I give them examples um, of what to put on that left side. Um, so the first few weeks or the first few days of class, I'll show them pictures of the past reflections and the ones that I show them and the ones that I'm going to give you are amazing. I mean, there's no way I'm not that artistic or creative. So there's no way that I could um, do this, but I, you know, I tell them start small and then add to it. And every year, um, as the year progresses, their reflections get better and better. A lot of our quizzes and some of our tests, I let them use their notes on their test to find information. So this is where the table of contents come in handy. They can look at that table of contents. And if the question is about, you know, blood flow through the heart, they're looking at that table of contents. It tells them what page it's on and they flip to that page. And a lot of times 
they tell me that they find their answers in their reflection easier and faster than they find the answers in the notes because they've converted that into their own words and their own way of understanding the material rather than the word for word notes that they wrote down on the left side from me. So I have used this for probably six years now, and I tweak it a little more each year. Um, like I said, I started out with um, a spiral notebook, and we would tape uh, pages in, like handouts that I would give them. They would tape it in, fold them, you know, um, ha uh, hot dog style, tape it in there. Um, now I use a three ring binder, and they we just hole punch it, and they stick it in where it needs to go in those notes, and then they add that to their table of contents. So. Um, you can use whatever works for you. My kids hate it at the beginning of the year and they love it by the end of the year. And I've had former students tell me that they use that style of note taking in their other classes and in their nursing programs and in their PA programs that have helped them um, kind of transform that information that they learned into their own thought processes. So they use that reflection a lot later on. Did I go over my time, Nancy? You did fine, Tony. Great. And we look forward to getting that handout. I love it. I love um, the reflection idea. That just sounds like a great way for them to recall and the research skills using the table of contents and all that. So thank you, Tony. Thank you for being the president of our teacher association. Now I'll pass the um, microphone to Karen Edwards. She'll tell you where she teaches and her role. And she's going to be talking about student contracts. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start this slideshow for you. So I stay on topic and not get too crazy. My name is Karen Edwards. I am the president elect for our association. I teach in a non criteria based magnet school, um, which means any student in our district is able to apply for our school. It's ninth through 10th grade, but we are non criteria based. So once they apply, it goes into a lottery system. And some company, I don't even know who picks, who is able to attend our school. So we have about 1,300 students currently um, enrolled in our school, again, ninth through 10th grade. And we've got several different magnets that we focus on. Exercise science is where my classes, all the health sciences are located. And I've been in there for about 10 years. So one thing that I find is very helpful is having a classroom contract or a student contract. And what we do is allow the students to kind of come up with the group norms and how we are going to behave for the rest of the year. So the first thing we do is, and you can see my little, this is a, the flip chart that I did this year. Um, every single one of my classes laughed because when I traced this from clip art, I did the hair in yellow and then you couldn't really see it from the back of the room. So it looked like she was bald, but that's okay. They, at least they were paying attention. Each student writes two to three things they think a great teacher does on a post-it. And this year, the color of the post-it was pink. And then they write two to three things they think a great student does on another post-it, and that was yellow this year. The post-its are then, they stick them up on the flip charts when they're done. That way, it's no pressure on a new student um, to have to speak in front of the class when they haven't met the rest of the students in there yet, or if they don't want to you know, seem like a suck up or anything else. I then go around and read the post-it. So I have another student in the class, whoever volunteers to do it, goes up to my whiteboard. They then dictate what I'm reading off of the post-it notes. And a lot of times you'll get the repeat ones. You know, um, for a great teacher, they like to say organized, fun, caring, empathetic, compassionate, all the things that we know a teacher should be. 
Um, and so those get repeated and you're like, okay, that's already on the board. Um, sometimes you need further explanation. Um, one of them was attentive and I was like, okay, well, what do you mean by attentive? You know, like, what do you think that person meant? And again, that way there's no pressure on the person who actually wrote it. Um, this year I saw a couple of them for things a great teacher does. They wrote actually teach. And so that needed further explanation. I was like, okay, well, what do you mean by actually teach? You know, like, do you not like worksheets? Do you not like PowerPoints? Do you need further explanation? And so that opened up a great classroom discussion of um, how they like the material to be presented to them. And it also allows you to like rule out things like great teachers give us movie days all the time. So then I take all of that um, information written on the board. I take a picture of it. We erase it. We move on with the lesson. During my planning, I then write up a contract. Now, this sheet that you see here presented, this is one from this year. I've kind of like scratched out the names at the bottom, but it is on probably about a half sheet size of flip chart paper. It's just some paper that I got cut it and I wrote in this class we promised to adhere to the norms we set as a group because now they're taking ownership of it and you know that's how we're going to be a great teacher student and health professional and the words that my seniors came up with because they're double blocked are responsible and supportive compassionate um, you can see this was the class that had attentive respectful encouraging timely feedback supportive and fun. That was like one thing they were like, we just want to have fun while we're doing all of these things. So once everybody has signed it, um, I have our lovely media center laminate it for us. I hang it up above our whiteboard. That way, if, you know, they're having a squirrely kind of day and we need to get focused back or if, you know, maybe they're picking on each other about um, somebody may have made a mistake or something like that, then I can easily point up to it and say, hey, you know, just so you guys know, you said we're not gonna do this. And then they can also hold me accountable too. Like, hey, you said, you know, not that I use PowerPoints. I don't like teaching from PowerPoints. It's, uh, but they're like, oh, you know, you said no PowerPoints. And I'll go, oh yeah, that's right. You guys don't like that. So that was one thing that I do in my class to kind of get started. I know some of us have already started, but this is something that you can integrate in as you were either teaching employability skills or communication. Um, you can really throw it in there anywhere if you have already started. So I know there's some stuff going on in the chat. Um, definitely break down respectful and what that looks like. Um, oh, I didn't even know that was a model. So yeah, if there's any questions, just let me know. If not, the presentation itself will be in with Nancy's stuff that she sends out and I've included my email address too. So if you have any questions throughout the year for me about whether it's joining the association, um, the upcoming conference, which is going to be amazing, and in one of my favorite cities, Charleston. Um, or if you just have like other random questions, feel free to email me throughout the year. So yeah, thank you, Karen. We appreciate what you do for teachers and for sharing your expertise. And so our next presenter is Amanda Bolin, and Amanda's going to talk about how she introduces HOSA Future Health Professionals to her students early on in the year. So Amanda, tell us a little bit about what you do with HSEA. Oh, I love your slide. And also um, your teaching setting. All right, hey everybody. So I'm Amanda Bolin. Um, I'm from South Carolina and um, I teach currently at Cyber Academy of South Carolina. So it's an all virtual school. So a little bit different than um, what a lot of you teach at um, with brick and mortar. Um, 
I am uh, the secretary with HSEA, and you may have seen some newsletters go out that um, have my name attached to those. So um, that's all for me too. So, um, but yeah, so we're going to talk about HOSA. I know a lot of you are not um, new teachers that are here, but some um, of you are. And so this is really directed towards you on um, what, what is HOSA and why you should um, be involved in HOSA um, and that kind of thing. So, um, so what is HOSA? HOSA is a student-led organization whose mission is to empower I think Manda froze. Okay, there you go. Interested in the same thing. Oh, sorry. Um, so we can link them to um, other students interested in uh, what they're interested in. Um, connect them to other healthcare professionals around the, um, the United States and the world. Um, and then, so currently there are 54 uh, chapters that are represented um, with states, country, with 54 states, countries, and territories. So um, the chapters represent a lot. Of um, so how do you start a host of chapter? Um, you're going to want to talk with your, uh, or decide if you want to sponsor one and decide if you have more than one health care health science teacher uh, who's going to be the local advisor you can get a charter number and your state advisor if you don't know who that is um, there is a list on posts website and i do have it linked into the presentation that um, that you'll be getting as well um, and then after you do that, you want to recruit students and um, then you need to affiliate your chapter. And so once you've done all of that, having fun and uh, create your bylaws and elect officers and things like that. All right. So this is for everybody. Um, so when was HOSA officially organized? And you can put it in the chat. What, um, what year do you think HOSA was officially organized? I see some of the right answers. <laughs> this, um, and it was um, Googled it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the attendees of the constitutional convention included state supervisors, advisors, teachers, and over 300 student leaders. So 1976 is the official answer there. All right, so um, this year, 2022-2023, uh, HOSA's theme um, is Beyond All Limits. And so um, it's a new year, time for new traditions, way to do things, changing perspective, adjusting goals, um, and again, getting ready to go beyond those limits. So um, really excited about the theme this year and Be The Match is um, our partner uh, for the HOSA service project. Um, so there's some stuff linked into the slide with that as well. So you can learn more about that. Um, but they have been um, our service project for the last couple of years and uh, it's really a good um, organization to, to partner with. And if you didn't know, one of, there is a video out there that one of our own officers was able to participate with this. So um, a really good video out there to watch. And then last but not least, just to um, look forward to some competitive events. Um, we do have, you know, of course your state will have a competitive event and um, those are all different times. So I didn't put that on there. So just talk with your, advise, your state advisor about what time that'll be. Um, but then we look forward to the International Leadership Conference in uh, June, and it's gonna be in Dallas, Texas this year. So i um, super excited about that. So thank you everybody. And if you uh, need to talk to me about anything, um, there's my email address and um, Melissa later is gonna be talking more about HOSA. So you'll learn more information about that. So. Make sure you stay tuned and 
uh, come back for that. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda. And we know that you probably had to be very creative since you're in a virtual setting, but you've had to be creative in how you are able to facilitate a host of chapter with students that you don't always see face-to-face -face or rarely see face-to-face. -face. So our um, congratulations to you as I think you're able to pull that off as well. So if anybody teaches in a virtual setting, Amanda has all the information about how to do that. So I appreciate um, your expertise, Tony, Amanda, and Karen. Thank you for sharing um, note-taking, student contracts, and also HOSA, introducing HOSA early on. We'll hear from some more members of the uh, leadership team for the Health Science Educators Association later on this afternoon. But today, we are excited to welcome Michelle Deck. Michelle is from Louisiana, and she has extensive experience in training career and technical educators across all pathways, across all career cluster areas. But we know that she knows that health science educators are really the best because she is one of us in her first life. She's a registered nurse and she spent many years as a nurse educator. And when um, we thought about how we could be supportive to new teachers and also experienced teachers, all the way to ones who've had 39 years experience, there was only one name that came to mind and that was Michelle Deck. So with that, we're gonna pass the microphone to Michelle and she has the privilege of keeping you engaged for four hours or so, but she, um, she assures me she can do that. And she's also gonna give you a bathroom break somewhere along the way. So thank you, Michelle. We appreciate you being with us. Thank you, Nancy. <clears throat> wow. Let me start off by thanking everybody for making time to put some new tools into your toolbox to start with your absolute best year ever. I am excited and thrilled to be here with you to share some teaching ideas, some ones that you can take and use in your classroom. You can adapt or adopt because let's face it, you do a hard job but you love doing what you're doing, right? And starting off the best year ever is our plan today. So I'm going to invite you to step into the shoes of your learner and to get as involved as humanly possible here in the virtual world. And one way that I'd invite you to do that is to join me on Mentimeter. And you can do that in two ways. You can take another device, such as a phone, an iPad, or some other device, and you can scan the QR code, and it'll take you right to where we're going for participation. Or if you want to just go straight to the internet from the same computer and go back and forth, you can go to www.menti.com, and you can put in the following code. And I'd ask if one of my colleagues who's the co-host would put this in the chat, 33630559. Now, if you zap the QR code, it'll take you there immediately. And you'll be able to respond to questions. You'll be able to put your feedback in in the slides. And at the very end, I will be able to share with you, not just my slides, but you'll be able to see everybody's participation and answer as a part of our time together. So do me a favor and join in, step into the shoes of a learner today and participate because we know learning is a partnership, right? We as, as educator, half the equation, the other half of the equation is the learner and we have to be working together back and forth, back and forth. So I invite you to do that. There's just one other tiny thing that I need to do when I share my screen and it's to get the sound that I'm going to share with you here in just a minute. So thank you so much for being willing to participate today with me here on Mentimeter. So here we go, let's... Look at your best year ever. And I'm gonna share some of those creative strategies that can ready you and your students for success. You'll notice in the bottom part of the screen, there are some emojis that you can 
uh, tell me how you're feeling as we go through the slides. So what are we thinking about? Hmm, what are we thinking about? Well, let's see, what are we thinking about today? Hello, teachers. I want you to imagine your best year ever. What would you do to set your classroom up to make it so? What would the students come in and see? Would there be a variety of slides or a variety of hands-on material? Some wheelchairs, some medical supplies, things they could pick up and touch. What would you do to make it the best year ever? Ever, ever, ever. That's what we're going for. We're going for the best possible year that we can have. So I want you to imagine, what would your best year ever look like? And what would happen during that best year ever? So I'm going to ask you to go to Menti and put in your thoughts here. What would it look like? What would happen in your best year ever? And if any of you are unable to get into technology, the chat's always a great place to put your comments as well. So look at this. Yes, what would it look like? Now, I want you to notice as we're seeing what our colleagues are putting in here that I have some pineapples because, you know, BYE, best year ever, it's sort of like a little vacation for us mentally and for our students as well. So look at some of the things that are coming here. Fully engaged students, respectful, excited teachers. Ooh, wouldn't that be nice? And engagement, engagement. I'm seeing a lot of that here as well. Ah, how important is it? Thank you for your feedback. Look how wonderful this is. So a dear friend of mine, Fred Lockhart said this, and I thought it was such a good quote, I wanted to share it with you. The real magic of being an inspirational educator lies in the constant upgrading of our ability to connect with learners. Oh my gosh, would you not say that this is true, to connect with them on many levels, not just connect with them verbally, but to be able to really see and get closer and closer in our communication and our understanding of our students and our students with us. Ha, huh. you know, Fred made this comment shortly before the pandemic. And it came back when it, when it said to me, our ability to connect with learners. And we have to be able to connect with learners virtually now as well. So he was sort of a uh, little hint of what was coming with how many of us had to go almost completely virtual or completely virtual for a period of time. And now to be back face to face with learners for some of us is, is very gratifying because it's still possible to connect. So what does it mean? We saw engagement all over those first slides. Well, this is the engagement formula here, of course. It's EC plus AB. <laughs> what does that stand for? That stands for emotional connection plus active behavior. Now, you and I know what it's like to have our learners involved and active throughout our class. And I am sure many of you do that. The part of engagement that I was at first un- uh, knowledgeable about when I first started doing education was the emotional connection part because I looked at how much content there was to teach and how little time there was to get it across and so anything that I thought was what I call fluff uh, out of here history no way we can do that got to get right down to it I have a lot of content I have to get it but you know what I noticed something troubling going on while I was jumping into lecturing about important content, I noticed some of my learners were whispering to each other. They weren't paying attention or they were digging in their bags or fooling with little devices they had hidden. They were not connected to me. They were connecting to others. They were whispering, oh, I don't want to be here. Oh, this is boring. Why am I doing this? Or they were connecting, complaining to each other, <laughs> texting. So what they were doing is they were making an emotional connection. Yes, they were, but it was in the negative. And you know what happens? When just two of your students, you've seen it, you've done it, 
two connect in the negative, they can recruit all the others quickly to the dark side. And then you and I have to fight that negativity for the rest of the time that we have them. So it's important for us to know that we can orchestrate the connection that people make in the beginning of our classes. And that connection is really, really important in that we can proactively connect people in the positive by inviting them to share some positive communication with each other in just the first few minutes of class. Now, ideally we want them to communicate about what we're teaching them, yes. So emotional connection plus active behavior. So there are actually four types of learner engagement. The first is academic engagement. And this is where people do something because they have to. So you say, okay, in order to pass this course, we have this many tests you have to pass. We have this many assignments. This is what you have to do. So students will sometimes become academically engaged because they want to be successful in the course. Second type of engagement is behavioral. And this is where they're doing something. They're hands on something. It doesn't matter what it is, but they are actively involved. Cognitive engagement is where we teach them to problem solve or we teach them to think critically. We teach them to have higher levels of knowledge than just remembering, just memorizing. We teach people to think like someone who would be in a health career, think like an athletic trainer, think like a nurse, think like a certified nursing assistant, whatever. We want them to be able to make judgments and make decisions that are good for someone in that career. And then emotional engagement is the first one that I first started talking to you about. This is where people connect in the positive. And the other emotional connection that people make is when they tie it to their life experience. Can your students see why they should or why they shouldn't do certain things because the emotional connection? Oh, Oh, my, my family member has that particular condition. Oh, that becomes real to me. Oh, I've seen this happen. That sort of connection moves information and skills into long-term memory quickly and easily. So now it's time to get involved. It's time to get involved. So let's see if we can in any way get you involved by coming to think what's one thing do you think you all have in common with the other people here who are teaching so let's think about it put it in the chat what's one thing you think you all have in common with everyone here that may or may not have anything to do with teaching so let's look to commonalities and then we're going to do some trivia let's see I'm looking at the chat here. What do you think you might possibly all have in common? Yeah, gave up part of a Saturday. That's a good one. Ah, very busy people. Oh, look, teaching technology, passionate. Wow, loves pens, pencils, papers. Yay, yes. Please keep putting in. What do you think we have in common? Ooh, caring. Human beings who care. Look at this. And you know, your students can tell when you care so much it shows in what we model. So some of us love to teach and that's one of the reasons we're doing this. So time for some trivia. What is the most used social media platform among Gen Z? That's the people you're teaching in your schools. What's the most used social media platform among Gen Zers? Well, let's vote. I have five possibilities here. Is it YouTube? Is it Instagram? Is it Facebook? Is it Snapchat? Is it TikTok? So let's see from your experience, which of these do you think is the most used social media platform among Gen Zers? We'll give everybody a chance to vote here. Again, if you're not in with me on Mentimeter, I invite you to go up to the address up at the top of the screen and, and join me, or if you wanna put it in the chat, that's good too. Right now, TikTok and Snapchat are neck and neck. Let's see what's in the chat. Now we have snapping over here in the chat, a TikTok or two. 
All right. Well, it looks like the votes are pretty, pretty stable. A couple dots still floating in. All right. Let's see what the answer is. It is Instagram. Yes, I know that's a, a bit of a surprise, isn't it? At 62% followed by YouTube. Wait, 65 Instagram, 62 YouTube. What? For Gen Zers? That's a surprise to most people. But I promise you it came from the latest Pew Research. Just looked it up this week. So it's important for us to know, this sounds like a lot of people are very visual if they're in YouTube watching things. Hmm. Let's jump into our crucial educator strategy. Number one, create awareness of learner engagement and digestion. And so I have a, a pineapple saying here. <laughs> I disagree too, but Pew Research says that. A pineapple a day keeps the worries away. Wouldn't that be nice if all our worries could just float away in our best year ever? So what do I mean by create awareness of learner engagement and digestion? What do I mean by that? Well, it's important for us to realize that some of the people you and I are teaching are mental internet surfing. That's right, look at our, our puppy dog here. They're, they're mental internet surfing. They may not be paying attention when you and I are giving important content and skills. So let's look at some of the signs and symptoms we see when that happens. So the first sign and symptom is nap jerk. Has anybody ever seen that? This is when the students just start to drift up and then they jump right before they, they go into a deeper state of consciousness. Nap jerk is a possibility. Also a Pez head. So how is Pez candy dispensed? It is dispensed through the neck. So, oh, the head goes back. That's correct, the head goes back. Or maybe, maybe you have a learner who's a Bombi, a Bombi. What is a Bombi? This is someone who looks like this, ready? Yep, just sort of that frozen stare. You realize their bodies are here, but their brains are not. So the name Bombi I made up because I think people look like zombies in class when they do this. But zombies, according to the dictionary, are undead creatures without a brain. And everyone we teach has a brain. So brain plus zombie, Bombi, I put it together, yes. And then there's eyelid Pilates. This is where they, the students try to, you know, rack their eyes open and you know trying to stay awake yes let's see some other signs and symptoms of mental internet surfing prayerful thought well this is where people prop their heads and try to look as if they're deep in thought they're leaning on their their fists yes indeed i won't say i've seen it at meetings but you may have prayerful thought then you're doing a fabulous explanation. You are so excited. You're saying, gee, I've never explained it this well before. A student raises their hand. You say, oh, what question do you have? And they ask you a question that has absolutely nothing to do with what you were talking about. I call it the where did it come from question. Oh my goodness, yes. They're not with you. They're surfing in their brains. Followed closely by the I just said that question. Have you had this one? where you're going through a list of steps. So if the person stops breathing, first we do this, then number two that, then number three this, and the student goes, oh, Ms. Deck, what do I do if somebody stops breathing? Okay, I just, I just said that. Now, some people see doze doodle. This is where the student puts their head down on a desk and tries to appear as if still writing notes next to them. Doze doodle, that's where the heads go down. And then of course the glowing lap stare, that's when some device is hidden in their lap and they are TikToking or they are online shopping or they are doing a variety of things. So any of those signs and symptoms are not promising because indeed that means that they are mental internet surfing. So let's look at why mental internet surfing happens. Well, it happens because speed of speech, how fast you and I can talk, is 110 to 160 words per minute. That's how fast you and I can talk. But our learners think much faster than that. Speed of thought is 400 to 1,000 words per minute. 
That's how fast they think. So I want you to look at that, this image here. We're walking slowly on a sidewalk, but our learners are on the 10 speed bikes trying to take off and leave us behind. So I want you to think about this. Is it possible? Is it possible for someone on a bicycle that's a 10 speed to slow down enough for people to stay with somebody walking on a sidewalk? Can somebody on a 10 speed slow down enough to stay with someone walking on a sidewalk? Is that possible? Hmm. If so, give me a heart down in the screen. Is it possible? Is it possible to stay? Let's see your thoughts on this. Or is it sort of impossible? Well, I think I'm seeing a couple of hearts floating up. Yes, it is possible for our learners to slow down their speed of thought to stay up with us. But there's only a short period of time that they're gonna be willing to do that before they get on their mental 10 speeds and they leave us in the dust. Yep, indeed. So I'm gonna stop here a minute, stop my share to show you something I think is important because our learners only have a cupful of attention retention. That's it. All they have is like a little cupful. And if you look at the educational research, it'll tell you somewhere between nine and 11 minutes is the optimum time if I'm lecturing to keep doing the same thing before I lose them. So let's say this is nine to 11 minutes of just me talking. All right, there it is. But let's say I have my content from my class. Oh, look, it's a bottle. It's a bottle of water. But some of us have five gallon jugs of content to get across to people, don't we? Indeed. So what happens is we start delivering our content. Yeah, and then we get to the rim and we start to see a couple of little symptoms. But some people say, hey, that's not my problem. I need to keep... Oh goodness, I need to keep serving all that content. I do because uh, that's my job, content delivery. And uh, you know, I don't care if I lose them. I don't care if they're gone because that's what I did. I delivered all the content. But what happens to the content folks? It's lost in spillover. It's lost in spillover and it doesn't stay in the cup. And what stays in the cup may mean that's all the nice to know and all the need to know went into the garbage can I have down here that's full of water now, but not memory for my learners. Wouldn't that be bad? You and I never want to have spillover, and there's actually two ways we can prevent it. So here's the first way. I'll demonstrate. That's the first way. That's called stop and let them digest. Yep, let them digest. What does digestion mean for you and I as educators? I'm wiping off my computer that's now drenched. What it means is that we have to stop and get them to think. We need to get them to apply. We need to get them to process. Why is this important? What will happen if we skip this step? What will happen if we're taking care of humans and this were to occur? Thinking is digestion. So you can stop and ask them to think, or even better, you could get a whole stack of cups and you could deliver it in cupfuls. So there's never any spillover. So how do you and I get a new cup of attention retention? Well, here's what we have to do. And I'd like for everybody, wherever you are and whatever you're doing to join me with your hands. So put your hands up like this. Okay, good. Yeah, I see some of you doing that. All right. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to move our hands forward and say, say, change something I'm doing. So let's say it and move them. Ready? Change something I'm doing. And now I want you to turn them up toward the ceiling. And I want you to push those up and say, change something they're doing. Let's do it together. Change something they're doing. Nice. So how do we get a new cup of retention? change something I'm doing or change something they're doing. Very nice, yay, I applaud you. I see people doing that. 
So something has to change. We can't just keep pouring into the cup and having all of that knowledge spill over. That is not the goal. The goal is you and I have to change something. It could be that we're in the middle of a deep explanation. So now we, we go ahead and we just put up a 60 second YouTube that shows, demonstrates what we were just talking about. Or maybe we move to the poster we have on the side of the room. Or maybe as we heard the ideas earlier, we say, copy this down into your notes. Or maybe we put up a funny cartoon that has to do with what we were teaching. Ha ha ha, oh, that's so funny. Oh, all right, now they're back. What's just something you could do to change it up when you start to lose people, when you start to see those symptoms of, mental internet surfing. That's what I'd ask you to think about. What can you do? Because we don't want, we do not want spillover to happen. And we know the two ways involve our hands, change something we're doing, change something they're doing. Very, very nice. So how do we prevent that spillover? And you see here, olive oil from Popeye. She is just trying to digest as much as humanly possible. So if you have a lot of content to get across to people and you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just like Olive. I keep, you know, really hitting them hard. I'd like for you to go ahead and give me a thumbs up or give me some emoji or some thoughts. We're seeing people's comments. Yes, having them even just stand up a minute, turn to a neighbor and tell their neighbor what's the most important thing I just learned in the last 10 minutes, and then sit back down. Yes, indeed. Good comment. It's very, very possible. It doesn't have to be a big change. It just has to be some change. Simple activities to apply knowledge. Very nice. Yes, indeed. Just have to change. Offer, ask questions. Look, we're turn and talk. Think, fair, share. Very nice that this is coming up in Menti. Thank you for your participation here. This is wonderful. And you know, at some point, poor little olive oil, she's going to get full. We all eventually get full. But I thought you could appreciate this, this little image here. So as someone in the nursing field, and nursing loves evidence, I'd like to just cite two pieces of evidence on why you and I need to do what we're doing. So here's evidence during collaborative learning, information comes from collaborators rather than other sources. And that information is likely to become available exactly when it's needed, resulting in decreased load and increased learning. What does this mean? If you put people in twos, threes, four, if you invite collaborative learning to happen, if you create an environment of open communication in your classes. It means the learners will learn faster from some of their peers than us. And I've seen this 100,000 times, at least in my career of 44 years of teaching. It takes me 20 good minutes to explain something and people say, oh, I don't get that, Miss Deck. And a peer goes, she means blah, blah, blah. And they go, oh, that? Oh, yeah, I got that. Why? because it came in peer language. That sort of communication does not happen if you and I do not open up collaborative learning. And if we do, there are so many benefits that come from it. And so teaching our learners in the beginning to speak positively to each other is a good thing and that it models positive open communication. One more piece of evidence. When if you and I are going to teach problem solving, how do you problem solve? The easiest way to do it is by getting the students to problem solve. Not me lecturing on how to problem solve, but getting the students to solve problems. So it's not gonna surprise anybody what this study showed. When students in an experimental group were given four problems to solve, they significantly improved their problem solving abilities versus a control group that received traditional classroom instruction, which was a lecture on how to problem solve. So how do you and I get our learners to those higher levels of thought and problem solving? We offer them opportunity after opportunity to make decisions and to make choices that they would have to make in the career we're teaching. And that way, if they're gonna make mistakes in judgment, they make them with us on paper 
in a classroom and not on people in the real world. So any sort of problem solving activity or skills you wanna give your learners come through their practice of actually having problems to solve. So let's look at our crucial educator strategy number two, grasp the complexity of learner motivation. So look at this pineapple here. We need to stand tall and be sweet, indeed. B-Y-E, best year ever. It's important that we model well. It's important that we come from a place of positive communication with our learners. So let's jump into the complexity of learner motivation. So I have, before I ask you to vote, I'm gonna show you my students that are coming. I have three brand new students who are joining us today. Here's student number one. Let's see, can you see it? It's, it's a little earth, it's an earth, and it's a ball, it's an earth ball. So I always like to come up with one positive thing about a new student when I meet them that I can say in my mind and think about when I think of them. So what's one positive thing with my little earth here. Who can write something in the chat that's positive about the little earth ball right here? And we'll see what some of those are. Ah, yeah, like the colors. Yes, very nice. It's a pretty blue. All right, let's meet student number, number two. Here it is. It's a koosh ball. Can you see it? It's a koosh, kind of a, a soft ball, koochie. How many of you? have ever seen one of those soft little cushy balls. What's one positive good thing about a cush? It is fluffy. Yes, it is interesting and fluffy. It's soft, there's mine. It is, it's fun, it's flexible. All right, all good traits in a student. So here's student number three, it's a rock. So what's a good thing about a rock? Go ahead, tell me, what's a good thing about a rock? Ah, solid, hard firm. Oh, all right. All good things. So let's pretend as part of our program, what each of these students must master is the ability to bounce. And that in the careers, in, in our health career, when they leave us every day, they're going to have to bounce. That's what they're going to have to do. So I'm going to ask you to vote here on Menti as to which of these three students do you think will do best at bouncing? Will it be the earth? Will it be the koosh? Will it be the rock? So this is just our initial impressions. You know, sometimes it's good to have an initial impression of our learners. So which one? I'll give you a minute to vote here. And again, if you aren't in Menti, please put it in the chat. Okay, people are already starting to think about, huh, look at this. What service, the surface, what? Yeah, in general, general bouncing, we'll go with that. And then we'll talk about the surfaces in a minute. So it appears here that most of the guesses that people are putting in, most of the voting, it's not guesses. Most voting is that student earth will do the best, student koosh, appears to be second, and student rock will come in third. So actually, if I was with you, I would bounce these, but I'm not. So I have just a brief video snippet of me having a bounce off with a group of people. So we could actually see which of these three under the circumstances will bounce the highest. Now, the people that you're gonna see the video of are hospital educators, and they're meeting their learners who are new employees. So stay with me here and we'll watch a brief video. Wow, we've got five. <laughs> okay, Yvonne, you be one of the judges. You stay right over here. And, and will you be, Deborah, will you be one of the judges and we'll have these three educators here. 
So there are three new employees that are coming to your facility. And here's the first one. It's an earth ball. And part of the skill set of what they have to learn how to do is to bounce. So let's have the audience vote. How, well do, how many people think an earth ball will bounce well? Raise a hand, an earth ball. Oh, okay. Oh, good. You have your hand up. You'll get that one. All right. <laughs> so next up, we have a koosh ball. Part of what the koosh has to do is bounce every day, but it's good to find a positive thing about a new employee, right? So what's a good thing about a koosh? It is easy to catch. That's yours, Susan. There you go. The third employee is a rock. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. What's your name? Florence, I'm so sorry. You're getting the rock. Now, now hold on. We're going to vote again. Who thinks the earth will do best in a bounce-off contest here? Raise a hand versus the others. Who's voting for the Koosh guy? Raise a hand. And how about the rock? There's a few. There's a few. Now, see, what really good educators do is they motivate their new colleague to bounce, because that's the job. They have to do every day, they have to bounce. So we're going to have a, a bounce off, and we have the two judges right here. I'm going to count one, two, three, bounce it. And the three of you are going to put your energy into, oh goodness, into your, your new employee. And, and the judges and the whole audience will see which one is the highest performer. Right now, most people voted for the earth, right? Okay, we'll see what happens. Are you ready? One, two, three, bounce it. <laughs> wow. Don't worry about it. It's, it, look, look. Okay, the official word from the judges. Who won that? The Rock outperformed the other two. Florence. All right. I was so distracted by that. <laughs> Who came in second, judges? It was the earth ball, okay. All right, how'd the, how'd the little cushy do? <laughs> wah, wah, so sorry. So let's give our three volunteers and the judges a big hand, thank you. So the one who won was the rock. The Rock actually bounced higher than everybody else. Second place was the Earth. Third place was the Koosh. So this, this raises some interesting questions. It raises the question of what are some of the important factors that affect learner motivation? That's what's important for us to think about. What are some of the factors that affected how high the balls bounced? So people were starting to hint at factors earlier. What are some of the factors that affect learner motivation? What could that be? I wonder, what could it be? So time for you to put in some, some things. What affected how high the balls bounced? Because it's the same thing that affects learner motivation. Oh my goodness, lots of factors. I see, ah, what they're made of, what they think they can. Look at this, sleep deprivation, positive reinforcement, force of the drop. Wow, materials, interest. All of these are fantastic. Keep going. Yes, indeed. P people believe in them. Do people believe in them? Their personal experience, their mental toughness, all of this, fantastic. Keep it up. What are the things that affect learner motivation or how high the balls bounce? Look at this home life is coming up. Temperature, yes, definitely. People are too hot or too cold. Look at this, the effort from the teacher, which I think equals the force of the drop. How much energy do we put behind them, folks? How much do we invest our, our caring, our empathy, our energy into our learners? All incredibly important. 
Yes, as these are coming up. Teacher attitude, willingness to learn. So I'm going to stop my share for just a minute and come to my three learners here so that I can share a couple things with you. Let's start with the earth. So I saw one of the things somebody brought up was what are they made of? What are they made of? So let's start with the earth ball. The, the earth ball is actually a squish ball. Look at this. It's a stress ball. So for stress relief, it's great. For bouncing, not so good. Goosh ball, invented by a man trying to teach his two young sons how to bounce a ball without it hurting their hands. And for that, it's perfect. There's no sting when you catch a goosh ball. Bouncing, not so good. Okay, let's look at our rock. The rock, it, it outperformed the others because it's, it's actually made of super ball material. It just looks like a rock. So have you ever had a learner? Because I know I have, that I've walked down the hall going, oh, he got other gifts, she got other gifts, they got other gifts. If my gift is a Super Bowl, is I made a Super Bowl material, I'm gonna bounce really high. If my gift is not stinging hands, that's what I'm gonna be best at. If my gift is stre stress relief, that's what I'm gonna be good at. Sometimes we can't always predict with certainty who those students are. I may look and say, wow, that person, the earth is gonna, gonna do better than everybody else. And they don't, the rock does. So sometimes perception is one of the things that affects learner motivation. Our perception of them or their perception of us. Have you ever had that learner who was pretty much like, uh, what can then that old, old lady teach me? You know, people misperceive us and they think, oh my goodness. What does that one know? Nothing, <laughs> nothing credible. And you know, working with teenagers, credibility is, is put in some odd places, not always in adults, not always in teachers, but sometimes in peers, sometimes good, sometimes not, that all matters as well. And I saw someone in the beginning write that one of the things that affect motivation was the surface we were bouncing on. So if I was bouncing these three balls on sand, I would get a different result than I would on a gymnasium floor, or I would on uh, a ball pit uh, at a birthday party. So the environment makes a difference, perception makes a difference, and all of the wonderful parts we put on that screen that I'm gonna go back to. All of this affects learner motivation. And you and I have to keep that in mind, that motivation is a complex thing. It's not quick, it's not simple. It has many factors that go into it. But there is one thing for us to bear in mind in the learning partnership, and that is, we are only half the equation. They're the other half. So partnership, learner, educator, learner, educator. Which of those two do we have 100% control over? Us. We have 100% control over ourselves. And if we're in the right place, then we're inviting them to join us there. There's an old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. But what you and I want to do as educators is we want to get the best, best, most beautiful bit of oats. We want to take a salt shaker. We want to put lots of salt on the oats. When the horse is hungry, we want to feed the salty oats to the horse. And then when we bring the horse over to the water, the horse is thirsty. So it's more likely to drink. That's what we wanna do with our learners. We wanna create the environment where they're thirsty. We want them to come with us on the journey. So we have 100% control of ourselves. Let's talk about educator motivation. So I have a professional adult motivator. We're gonna watch for three minutes and I want you to take in absolutely everything that this person does to make it motivating to his learners. Let's watch and see. Oh, 
wrong button. Let's watch and see now. Hey, I want to dance with somebody. That's all it takes. It just takes two minutes of Richard Simmons for us to have some factors that affect educator motivation. So let's see what people are putting. Welcoming, notice he welcomed everybody. He modeled positive behavior for sure. Positive, positive, you have to give Richard that indeed. What are some of the factors that affect educator motivation? Oh, clear instructions. There's a good one. There's clear instructions. As these are coming up, his energy, his energy shines for sure. And he is in the middle of the group and he does have charisma. Told them they were doing great. Yes, he reinforced what, what was going on that was done right. Right. Oh, he's happy to be there. Look at his tone, his passion, his enthusiasm. I love the way he took it up. Do you notice he started really basic? And then he said, let's shake it up. And he took it up so it was more complicated. Ah, says it and demonstrates, uses small groups. He's ex yeah, he was excited and encouraging. I love this one. He doesn't care what other people think. Notice none of those people were in the high, expensive exercise clothes. None of them were exercise uh, bodybuilder models. No, he had what I'll call real people because they are. At the end of this particular uh, video that he had, people introduced themselves and how much uh, weight they had lost after their lifestyle change. So it's important that you and I model reality for people. You know, we don't have to be perfectly coiffed and perfectly chiseled to get out there and exercise with Richard. In fact, um, if you look at some of the more complicated videos, Billy Blank, I love him, but in one of his, in the first two minutes, he does a split in midair about six feet up from the ground. And there's no way on the planet that I as a real person would be able to master that at this point. But I think I might be able to master what Richard is doing here. So it's important for us to put ourselves into the best place we can. And one thing you, you have to give Richard, he does model what it was that he wanted his learners to do. Notice he greeted them all when he saw them. Do you greet your learners when you first come into your class? Are they your focus or are you tied up in, in trying to get everything ready? Think about how you can be learner focused. And I would ask you 
to pick just one behavior you would like to commit to doing with your learners that's positive. So go to the chat and let's see what we're saying. You know, we saw this example of Richard. What's something you may do now and you may want to do a bit more, or maybe you haven't tried yet? Are you going to greet your students? Are you going to model positive behavior? Are you going to take it in steps of complexity? Oh, look at this, people already welcoming them, telling them the best class they will have this year. Oh, good. Best year ever, right? We're going to frame it. This means, oh, learn people's names and greet them by their names. Very important. Good morning or afternoon. Giving time to digest information, shorter teaching sessions, more interaction. It's important for us to be somewhat excited about we're teach, what we're teaching people too. I know there's parts of content I teach that I'm not always in love with. But if I'm not excited about it, how can I get them excited about it? Look at this, smile when you're welcoming them, student action balanced with presentation, energy, and make sure I believe in every one of them. These are fantastic. Look at this, best teachers listen. Yay, yay, yay. So Richard modeled that. And you know, one thing that few people know about Richard, is every day that he was involved actively in changing people's lives, he would get on the phone before there was social media and call between 20 and 25 people a day to encourage them in their lifestyle change to go on. People who for many years had been inactive, he did that. He didn't get paid to do that, but that was his passion. And it's important because it shows that sort of belief. So crucial educator strategy number three, give the learner the experience. <laughs> Look at this thing. Only the knife knows the heart of the pineapple. So how do you and I give people the experience? What do I mean by that? Well, let me share a few things that I've done. And I'm sure some of you have done some amazing involving activities as well. So if you want to teach about the spread of infection or the importance of hand washing, something you can use is glitter. Now in this picture here, you can see this glitter is gold glitter, but the glitter that I like to use is the pearlescent glitter that's see-through. So I'm gonna stop my share here for just a minute. So what I like to do, you go to a craft store, you get the pearlescent glitter that actually you can see the opalescent shine through it, but you can't see the glitter so much as you could gold glitter. So what I do is I wash my hands and when my hands are clean, I take the glitter and I pour some into my palm and then I spread it all over my hands. And I stand at the door and I shake people's hands as they come in. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good morning. And then I just go on with my class and I start teaching about infection control and the spread of infection and all of that. And after just a short period of time, I ask people to look at their hands or look at their wrists or look at their arms and see, do you notice any kind of glittery shine is there any glitter that you notice in your environment? And people start looking. And I don't know how many of you have ever used glitter, but it seems to multiply. So it's on the back of somebody's arm. It's on their cheek. It's, and people start, oh, yeah, wow, where did this come from? Well, it came from when you shook hands with me. I had a big old hand of glitter. Yes, I know there's germ glow that does this with black lights. But cheap and easy glitter, opalescent glitter, very easy to find, very easy to use. And then the students have to go and they have to practice hand washing and they have to be sure they get all of that glitter off. And I'll tell you, it's interesting to me where glitter ends up on sweaters and pants and desks. And it just, it just seems to multiply. So that's a simple, and inexpensive way to give them the experience of how easy it is to share germs and not even realize it. Or here's another favorite of mine, using ketchup. Yes. 
So one thing that they found years ago when the Ebola uh, germ came to the United States and people who took care of Ebola patients were completely PPE, they were in complete uh, equipment, but a couple of people actually caught Ebola and they figured out it was from when they were removing their PPE that they uh, contaminated themselves. So I've done this with students just having gloves on and I've done it with people fully gowned and masked and everything with PPE. You take your ketchup bottle and you put a good dollop of ketchup in the palm of the person's glove. And then you have them spread it around on their hands like this. And then you have them take off their PPE, take off their, if they only have gloves, take off their gloves. If they have the full body thing, take off their PPE. And then it's time for some good examination because the ketchup does fly. Sometimes it goes on walls. Sometimes it goes on gowns. Sometimes it goes in a variety of places. And what a better visual to see in the ketchup because it flies everywhere. So when we're teaching about the spread of infection, people are like, oh, I had gloves on. I couldn't possibly have caught that. Well, yes, having the gloves on is important, but how do we take the gloves off that might be contaminated with blood and body fluids? And that is something to be very, very careful with. Now, just an aside, because I um, do vaccines right now, I'm, I'm practicing nursing as well as teaching and I'm doing vaccines. And the newest, latest vaccine that we're giving in my area of the country is monkeypox. And in order to give monkeypox vaccines, we have to be fully PPE'd because it is a live virus and we are dealing with um, giving it uh, intradermally. And so it's important for all of us, yep, nowadays to know that the spread of monkeypox is through uh, blood and body fluids primarily, but by touch. And seeing those kinds of patients, important. Why am I telling you this? Because we need to ground our content in fact for our learners. We need to be able to show them the relevance and the usability of what we're teaching so that they can make the relevant usability, emotional connection in their brains to why they're learning this. Ooh, chocolate syrup too. That would be yummy, chocolate syrup. Yep, indeed, we could maybe take a teaspoon of that before the students come in as a little picker upper for ourselves too versus, ooh, strawberry jelly. I have used some interesting things on um, wounds where I have people estimate the amount of, of uh, exudate from a wound with a variety of red materials. So strawberry jelly comes to mind for that. So good, 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 yay. Get them the experience of it. How can you give them as much experience with it as possible? So if I was gonna teach critical thinking, there's two ways I could do it. Here's the first way, I could lecture it. And none of us will ever do this, but I'm going to poorly model this just so that we know we don't want to. Critical thinking is more than problem solving. It looks for prevention, improvement, best results. The ability to look ahead, determine desired outcomes. The ability to ask questions. What can we do better? What can we prevent? Characteristics of critical thinking include honesty, creativity, persistence, and confidence. Uh, ways to develop critical thinking, research or reading assignments, concept maps, open-ended questions, reflection, debriefing, uh, coach the, the, your learner through the decision-making process, ask effective questions that allow the learner to make connections, actual situation appropriate responses, closed-ended questions are not effective, the level of questioning can be simple to complex. All right, enough of that. It's time for us to do what I call the weakest think. So we're going to do the weakest think activity, but I'm going to back out of this for a minute to show you what it is. The weakest think is an envelope that's labeled the weakest think. Inside the envelope, I have three color-coded cards. Here's the first one. It says never in a million years. I know it's backward. Never in a million years. 
I have one that says it depends. It depends. So I've never in a million years I have it depends. And I have a green one that says all the time. That's what it says all the time. So my three choices for my learners are never in a million years, it depends, and all the time. Now in my envelope, I also have some little itty bitty pieces of paper that have scenarios on them. And I either give them to the learners to do individually or I do it collaboratively in groups where in collaboration, they could discuss, is this something we would do all the time? If so, take that scenario, sit it on top of the card that says all the time, or is it an it depends, sit it on top of that one, or is it a never in a million years, set it on top of that one. So let's do the first one that I have, and I'm going to have you vote on Menti, the answer of what you would choose if you were doing the weakest think with me. Here's one of my scenarios, let's go, here it is. You drop a $40 pill on the floor, do you pick it up and give it to the patient anyway? Now granted I'm teaching nurses, but I'd like for you to just go ahead and take a good guess. Do you pick it up and give it to the patient anyway. Yes, all the time I do that, or mm, it depends, or mm, never in a million years. What will it be for you? Give you a chance to go ahead and vote. Now, as the votes are coming in, I'd like to just share a brief little story. I was at a career college in California and I asked this question and five people on a group all said all the time. And when they answered that, I said, uh, could you explain your rationale behind all the time? And they said, oh, we're the veterinary tech program and our patients are all dogs and cats. And which case, that's not a bad answer. <laughs> it explained why they said all the time, because that's not an answer I was expecting to get, as I'm sure some of you would be like, hmm, do we really want to see that? I'm not so sure. I'm going to peek at the chat. Is it still in the package? No, no. Oh, look, five second rule. Yes. Interesting in the chat. So our voting is never in a million years. And yay, that's what I would want to have my learners say never in a million years. Why? Because I would be taking them into a facility where, let's say a hospital, a clinic, a, a retirement home, a assisted living, where they'd have a collection of pharmaceuticals we could replace that with. So that would be appropriate. That's what I want my learners to say never in a million years. Now, there's 12 people that says it depends. And there are actually three, yes, three different scenarios where this would be appropriate. So go to the chat if you voted it depends. And let's see what does it depend on because I'm dying to hear and see what it is. Oh, look at this, war zone or shortage? Yes, if it's the last dose in the state, if we're doing disaster nursing or military nursing, that would be appropriate. Life or death medication, yes. There's another scenario. Can anybody come up with it? Life or death medication for sure. No, nope, that's, we got one more thing where this would be appropriate. Ah, Karen Edwards, yay, home health, very good. If I was a home health nurse and I was in a home where my patient was colonized to everything and it fell on the floor, they'd probably say, hey, just pick that up and give it to me because we have a very limited supply and they're already colonized to their environment. Very, very good. Yay, thank you, Karen, being the first to say that. So, all right, that's just one of my little situations. Let's, let's look at another that you would pull out the envelope if we were together doing this. You're hanging holiday lights. Your lights have three prongs. Your extension cord has only two prong holes. Do you use it anyway? which means you either have to jam it in there and the grounding plug is sitting on the ground or you break the grounding plug off and therefore 
you just have the two prongs in the two holes. So would you do that all the time? Uh, it depends or never in a million years. Let's, let's see what people are thinking. The votes are still coming in. This is why I'm busy every year on the ambulance. Oh, such a good, such a good answer. Oh, I love that. That came up in a comment. So right now, never in a million years is winning. And that's what I'd want my students to say, but there are a few, it depends. I wanna see in the chat, what does it depend on? Oh, I have a converter plug if I can find it. Okay, that, that's, that's, but no mention of that right here. But yes, if you have a converter, multiple adapters at my house, all the outlets are only two prongs. So I have to use an adapter. Okay, adapter ready is good. You have an adapter, absolutely. Terrific. Do you ever break the prong off of the grounding plug off of the lights? There's my question. Do we ever do that? I hope you're yelling at your computer or your phone. No, no, no. No. Why? Because it's a risk. First off, if I'm at home, let's be honest, if I'm at home, I own my own home. It's on a big piece of ground. I live there by myself and I want to break all the grounding plugs off of my holiday lights. Whose risk is it? <clears throat> Primarily my risk, but you know, the fire department's family might want to have a little chat with me. Yep, they definitely might want to have a chat with me because it puts them at risk. <laughs> why, yes, why uh, ambulance rides are expensive. Yes, holiday lights are non essential. You could just wait and go and get an adapter, but. What if, okay, so I could choose to put some people at risk and do this, not a good plan, but I could. But if I was working in a hospital and I was going to hook a patient to let's say hmm, an IV pump and the IV pump has three prongs, which, you know, grounder, and uh, a student has found a plug in the drawer, a family member, an extension cord, a family member brought that has only two uh, holes in it, would it be okay for my student to break the grounding plug off of the IV pump to plug it in? What would that answer be? It would be no, never in a million years because it puts every human at risk. It puts the patient at risk. It puts the hospital at risk. It puts you at risk. It puts any human who touches that patient at risk for a micro shock that could stop their heart. So, when I take my learners into a clinical area, this is an absolute never in a million years. Now you're saying to yourself, why would you put this particular choice in your weakest think envelope? Because it happened. That's why. I'm not making this up. It happened. How do I come up with my weakest think scenarios? Well, Many of them come from my experience with learners where someone did something and I said to myself, what were they thinking? What were they thinking? And that's where my scenarios start because it could be a common problem or it could be something they all need to know. So here's one more for us to vote on. Should you wear your respiratory PPE when a patient has a bacterial pneumonia? So we're going to take care. We're going in the patient's room who's hospitalized with a bacterial pneumonia. Should you wear your respiratory PPE or should you just go in there and say, hey, how are you feeling? What's going on? And just, just don't, don't touch them. Just walk in and talk to them without your PPE. So how are we voting on this? I'll give you a minute to think about it and to answer. So we're getting some more variety here. So right now, all the time is winning. It depends. We have one never in a million years. Let's go to an it depends discussion in the chat. What does it depend on with your respiratory PPE? What does it depend on? Let's see what people are saying.
we have some no's, we have some no's, but I have nine people saying it depends. So let's see, it isn't viral. How could they have something viral that isn't known? Hmm, good question. Antibiotics, are they being treated? Good question. How long have they been on the antibiotics? Good, good, good. What would you want your students to do if they didn't know those questions to ask? Are they being treated for the antibiotics? How long have they been in? Yep. Are they tubed? Oh, good question. Excellent. So we don't just, do they have fever? Do they have other signs of infection? Are they on the upswing or are they on the downswing? Are they starting to look septic? All of that important, better to be safe than sorry, for sure, for sure. So I'd like to challenge you to think about for just a minute, if you as an activity in one of your classes would possibly create weakest think scenarios and just have your students go through them and make their decisions. Don't say what's right, what's wrong. Just have them take all your little scenarios, put them on the cards that they think they should be on and then go back and debrief each one so that if they're making mistakes in their critical thinking, see this is how to learn critical thinking, not lecture on it, if they're making mistakes in how they're thinking, you can correct that. And then you can always pull the weakest thing back out in six weeks or eight weeks and have them indeed uh, go back over it and see if they make the same decisions. Now that we're eight weeks further into our time together, into learning, into our experience. So I'm going to be brave here a minute if possible and ask, just quickly, if two or three people would unmute themselves and just say, what's a possible weakest think scenario you would give your learners? So if somebody's willing. If you can unmute yourself. Uh, this is Katrina Parker from Utah. Hi, I would Katrina. do one. I would do one in my exercise science sports medicine class where we talk about ethics. I would put the scenarios that we lecture on in that envelope and let them discuss the ethics of it, good or bad. I think that'd be a great tool. And it would be a great pre and post assessment too. They did it Correct. first, then you lecture on it, and then ah, oh, very nice. Give Katrina a hand, everybody. Virtual applause. Yay! Katrina, thank you. I have one. Okay, Ann. So I'm Ann and I'm in New Hampshire. Um, so back when I was on the floor nursing, I had a patient who had very bad diarrhea. It was so bad that they were sending them to the intensive care unit. We were not able to get IV access. So the doctor said, go ahead and give them oral potassium and then send them to ICU as soon as you've given it. Well, we, the, the student nurse went in and looked in the fridge and the only juice we had was prune juice. And so she gave the patient potassium mixed with prune juice before we sent them to the ICU. Oh and my. to all of us that are nurses, that's obvious, but to students, it's really not. Yeah. So the question is, would you give the patient potassium mixed with prune juice or hold the potassium or maybe mix it with water? Uh, those are basically your choices. Um, I find that one works well. Okay. Very nice. Thank you so much. Everybody applaud. Yay. Virtual applause for you. Let's hear from one more person. Hey, can you hear me? I can. This is Lissa from Florida. So I am currently teaching personal qualities of a healthcare worker. So I could see doing this by throwing out good and bad examples of the various qualities that somebody might have and would it make them a good healthcare worker or would it not? Something like that. Very nice. Thank you. Yay. Give a hand. And you know, you involve the learners. They're going to remember it way better if it's, than if it's just you and I going over it with them. And, and how much does it cost to do an envelope and a couple of index cards and you know just a sheet of paper with lots of little scenarios. So thank you all so much for your willingness to share and apply. 
So I'm going to bring us back to some crucial educator skills. Let me take us here. So thank you for your participation. We just did short scenarios. You just told me some. So if anybody else has a scenario that they'd like to share, now would be a good time to type it in. You didn't get a chance to verbally do it with us, but maybe you thought of one or two since then and you'd like to share it with us here. And at the end, I will send the document that collects all of the comments and all of the input that we've had and we'd be able to share those with each other. So I'll get quiet a minute take a sip of my water and invite you to put some thoughts in. Oh, HIPAA, <laughs> yes. Good old HIPAA. Ah. Body mechanics, yes, 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 for the CNA. An action a healthcare worker would be considered negligence. Ooh. There's the ethics. Thank you for sharing that one. Ethics is tough to teach, you know? It's not necessarily what people can put their hands on, but we're creating a hands-on activity. Ooh, first aid scenarios. Oxygen and smoking, oh, good one. Legal terms and scenarios, cultural diversity, such important topics. Thank you all for thinking about and sharing your ideas. I appreciate it. So does everybody else. So another activity that I've done is I've put people in pairs and played go fish. Now I know this sounds odd, but I've done it with terminology and definitions where I put people in twos, one person has to be a one, the other person has to be the two. And then I have all of these scattered uh, index cards with words on it upside down on a desk. And then what they have to do, the one has to pick first, they pick whatever it is, it's gonna be either a definition or it's going to be a term. And so that person has to say, here's my definition. Do you have the term that matches that? If the person does, they give it to them. If not, they say, go fish. So then person two picks up a card and they go back and forth with terminology and definitions playing two person go fish. And the whole class is doing this. It's not just two people. It's everybody broken into twos. And I find it's a good way to introduce content. It's a good way to um, evaluate content at the end. It's a good way to enforce concepts. So all you have to do is have things you can put in pairs. So terminology definition is what I've done with this. Now, I think if I'm going to teach about labor and birth, it's better for me to put a uterus that's pregnant into the hands of my learners. So I'd like to show you here how a uterus labors, because what I've done is I put a ping pong ball in my balloon. I put air in my balloon and I've turned it upside down. And at the bottom of the balloon, you can see the part of the balloon that's the neck of it. It's about two inches thick, just like a cervix is on a uterus. And notice my hands are at the top of the uterus and they are going to simulate contractions here. And when they simulate contractions, those contractions are going to cause us to birth, which we will see here in my video here in just a minute as it comes up. All right, are we ready? Here we go. Cervix is effaced. Now it's gonna to start to dilate. Notice, top of balloon. If you use this activity, it has to be at the top. 
There's birth. Indeed, there is birth. We're back to birth. To me, it's really neat to have the students all have a balloon that they put a ping pong ball in and that they put air in and then they start laboring. And what's interesting is if you do this in a class with all the students laboring, different balloons will deliver at different times. So some people will right away birth their ping pong balls and some people it takes longer. That is so true in real life when people have babies. If they were to take their ping pong balls and put it back in the balloon and do it a second time, it will take less time the second time than it does the first. Usually in a class that's about 30 people, at least one person will have a uterine rupture where they're not pushing from the top and the balloon will burst. And then I talk about what happens if a uterine rupture occurs to a patient and a baby, how it's life-threatening and what has to happen. And also sometimes people get over vigorous in uh, giving their uterus balloon contractions. And sometimes we have what looks like uterine dystocia where all the air goes out, but the ping pong ball is still inside. So this is a picture of a group of students who are laboring here uh, with, with their ping pong babies preparing to come out. I prefer to use hands-on things as often as possible with learners so that the hands-on learners, which they've shown Gen Z, the ones you're teaching are more than 60% kinesthetic or hands-on. So what I have here is a basket of babies and I'm going to open this, take it out and show you. I, I have my basket of babies. I saw these, now I'll admit I'm a grandmother and I have five granddaughters and five grandsons. So I'm always looking for little fun toys for the kids that not only are fun toys for the kids, but that I can use. I can take when they get tired of it and I can make it into a teaching tool. So what this is, uh, I saw it on the internet and ordered it. It's a basket of little babies of a variety of um, ethnicities and dressed in different ways. And so let's say the student picks this baby. Well, if you go into the baby's little jumper, what I have down in the bottom of the jumper is a critical thinking question. And that's what that person's group or that person has to work on as the problem of our time together. So let's see which one we got here, just so that you'll be curious. What if you're caring for a newborn infant in a level two nursery and the infant was born at 36 weeks gestation? So I go into some pretty good depth with my nursing students here on, and I'll save you the depth of it, on what do they need to do? So this maternal child question has to do with infants. But if we were to pick another, there might be one that has to do with the mother. There may be one that has to do with someone in labor, someone after they've delivered. One of them has to do with breastfeeding. So I was always taught that if we give the students a choice around things that aren't choices, that they're more happy to do it. So in other words, they're all going to answer a critical thinking question. It's just which critical thinking question will they have based on which of the little basket of babies they pick? Chance, chance gets into it. And I know sometimes students think we stay up late at night to try to think of complicated and hard questions to ask just them and no one else. And you and I know that isn't true, but anyway, we can make it more choice driven by the student, the less risk they think they have. In other words, they're not thinking, oh, Miss Deck always gives me the hardest questions. No, you picked it from the basket of babies, it's fine. So how can you use choice? Now, a friend of mine uses uh, popsicle sticks in a cup 
to choose her volunteers in class. And that's good. I just like to find things that are related to my topic. So if I'm teaching about mamas and babies, hey, multi-use tool. My grandchildren can play with it when they come over. And when they leave, I can use it as a teaching tool. Ooh, it would be good for growth and development. Look at that. How well would that be uh, in there? So look, somebody's looking there. They're soft. They're kid friendly. And as I said, can you shop with educator eyes? Can you start to look at the topics that you teach that you say to yourself, this stuff's kind of dry. This stuff needs a bit of new life. And so maybe I could find a hands-on teaching tool that I could use and give to the students that make it more real for them and their experience. So basket of babies, just one of my new favorites that I found, multi-use tool. Crucial educator strategy number four, use technology as a teaching tool. So if you like technology, put a little heart there because I saw there are some really young faces here Yay, 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 new young teachers. I am gonna say that as someone in my 60s, technology has been the thing that I'm most excited about learning. And I've had to find a reverse mentor, someone younger than me who can help me problem solve and not get so upset when things don't work the way I'm expecting them to work. So look at this. Pineapples have a cute little crown on top of them and they wear it proudly. So I'd like to share with you just a little bit of technology I've found that's been easy to master for any of my colleagues that maybe um, are not as uh, digital natives as some of the other teachers we have here. So good information on all, but this is easy to use technology. So let's start with the first one. It's clickers clickers. So you can see the students here are, are holding up a clickers card. And I'm going to back out so you can see an example of a clickers card because I have one right here. This is a clickers a card. There are 62 of them that come in a set. So if you go to www.clickers.com, you can print off for your students a clickers card. The clicker cards are all numbered. And depending on how you hold the card depends on which answer the students are answering. There's A, B, C, and D. So if my answer is A, it's here. If my answer is B, it's here. My answer is C, it's here. So it depends on how the students hold the card as to what answer your device is going to pick up. All you need for this is one either smartphone or smart pad to collect the votes of the learners. Let me show you a little video on it and a little more information about Plickers. And Plickers.com are free. All you have to do is print out the Plickers cards. So here are the students holding up. Here is the teacher's phone, if we look at it. You can see how many people answered which, A, B, C, or D. And if you put a roster into Plickers, you can see which student says what, as you can see there from this screen. So I'm going to show you just a really quick and easy little Plickers video. Hopefully. Yes, we're going to watch a Plickers video more ways than one to skin a cat. I like clickers when I first found them. The part I love best was that it's free, <laughs> right? Free is good because if I try free and I don't like it, it's okay because it's free and I can throw it away with no guilt whatsoever, right? No guilt whatsoever. There it is, no problem. So I am going to find my clickers video. There it is and show it to you. Hang on. See, I am learning technology. Yay! Here we go.
So that's Plickers. That's Plickers. Now, let me tell you what I love about Plickers. I used to have the students hold up index cards that were colored. So if the answer was one, it was a blue index card. The answer was two, it was a green index card. So that's what I would do. I'd put up multiple choice questions and I'd have the students hold up index cards. But it doesn't take long for row two, three, four, five in class to figure out they don't even have to read the question. All I have to do is look at what the people in the front row hold up and that's what they hold up. But clickers, all of the clicker cards look different. So nobody knows who's what direction. And yes, an Android, if you have a camera on an Android phone, it'll, it'll work. All you have to do is download the Plickers app. So what you do is you scan like this, your classroom. It doesn't pick it up more than once. You can go back if not everybody's was there. But I'm gonna tell you something I learned as someone older that I know all of you younger know, but I made this mistake. So I'll save you the trouble. Okay, you have to scan the phone or the iPad in the format that it's usually in. One time I said, oh, I'm going to turn it this way so that it's easier for me to hold. Well, that changes the answers from A to B. So it has to be in the normal format when you're scanning. I have used clickers in an auditorium type setting. As long as you scan where the learners are and they're holding up their clickers cards, you can see. The thing I like about Plickers is only one person has to tech, have technology to use it, it's me. So there are some people that I teach that don't have uh, phones. There are some people I teach that don't have plans on their phones that allow them to do some of the other fun things that are, that are possible. So Plickers, free, Plickers.com, give it a try. Is there anyone currently using Plickers that would be willing to tell us about their experience? If so, go to the chat. Let's see, anybody using clickers now? Free is our favorite word. Yes, indeed, Miss Nancy, free is our favorite word. All teachers' favorite words. So has anybody had a chance to use clickers? If you have, or if you haven't, please think about it, give it a shot. Let's see what the chat's saying. Not using yet, but will now. Great, wonderful. And you know, Plickers also has the option that if you put all of your learners' uh, names in and you use it as your roster uh, class, plan it will you can record all of their answers and it'll give it to you in, a, in an excel spreadsheet so it's actually a way to track too very nice used it before something about a limit on the number of free times that would be new i have used it and used it and used it uh they may have some limit on it now but i, I don't know what it is give it a try give it a try so there's the clickers video Next piece of technology that's free, that's what you want, free technology, is go to the App Store, read the reviews, and download a free QR code creator. Now, there are some apps, this is why you need to read the, the reviews. There are some apps that will allow you to use it three times free, and then you have to pay. Don't get that kind. Don't download those download a free, a free QR code creator. So let me explain why I'm suggesting this. Some of you may already do this. If you download a QR code creator app, it will create what looks like the square on the left-hand side of the page, which is a link to something that has an IP address, an internet address. So what I've done here, is I've used my QR codes in a variety of ways. So I've created questions and then the students have had to scan the QR codes and this takes them to the CDC where it talks about how do infections spread. I've done it because I teach pharmacology. So I'll have information on medications from the companies that make them, the manufacturers. I'll create a QR code and they'll have to go and read about that. I have created QR codes that take learners on a scavenger hunt from place to place to place to place. 
in stations to discover answers. I have used a QR code creator to take people on a scavenger hunt of a building to find certain places in a hospital, such as where is the parking permits? Where do we get paid? Where is the morgue? Where is the pharmacy? Where they go on a scavenger hunt and QR codes are in different places. I have created a QR code with a video showing how to set up and troubleshoot a machine. So that if somebody has to set up a pump and they've never used it before, one of my colleagues videos me troubleshooting the pump, I take the video, I house it on my own private YouTube channel, or if some of you have the ability to house that on your school website, then when the students scan it, it takes them to the video you made and they can watch it once or they can watch it 20 times if they need to, because it's a link to the video you've created. Now, I met an educator who was teaching licensed practical nurses, LPNs, and she said to me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the QR code creator and I'm going to create codes that I'm going to attach to my low fidelity mannequin. In other words, pretty much just this big doll. And I'm going to have my students start up at the top of the mannequin and go through and assess the patient with the QR codes. I said, well, tell me, what, what are you going to be specific. Tell me how you're going to do that. She said, okay, so I'm going to create a QR code on a, on a little card. And I'm going to put it between the patient's eyes and I'm going to have them, when they zap it, it's going to show them pupils that are equal and reactive. Then I'm going to put one on the chest. And when they zap it, they're going to hear lung sounds that come with the the textbook, then by the heart, mm, they're going to listen to breath sounds and heart sounds, and then they're going to go to, to bowel sounds. And then I'm going to have one of these that's just sort of on an arm and they're going to have to scan it. And it's going to have a wound that they need to be able to take care of. So while the mannequin is just a giant doll on the mannequin would be QR codes where the students would have to assess it as if it was a real patient. Wow, what would I do with that wound? I said, oh, this is good. She said, no, I'm not finished, I'm not finished. I said, oh, please continue. She said, after the students go through and they've examined all of the patient, they've watched all my little zaps that take them to, to pictures of real patients. Then I'm gonna go and I'm gonna change some of those out. And the students are going to have to go back and they're going to have to start at the head and see if anything's changed with this patient. What's changed and what would that mean? And, oh, what a great, wonderful idea of how to take a low fidelity mannequin and make it high fidelity, make it, make it change, make it do something that the students could figure out. So when you go to the app store, the best way to pick a QR code creator app is to read the reviews. Now, people have asked me, which one do you use? Well, the one that I have, I've used for the last four years. And when I downloaded it, it was free and it still is free for me. And somebody else downloaded it, they were like, oh, you can only do four of them. Oh, well, you know, read the reviews. I know there are ones that create the little codes. Now, when you create a QR code, what it becomes is it's a little picture file. So you can import it anywhere you want to put it. You could put it on a piece of paper. You could put it on a syllabus. You could put it wherever. So I'm going to share one more idea that a person who teaches physical therapists told me he did. What he did with his QR codes is his QR code creator. He created a picture of the body, you know, a medical picture of the body, how the hands are out and the legs are out. It's a little, really just the shape of the body. And what he put at each joint was a QR code. So at the wrist, he had a QR code. And when a student would zap it, it would show all the different exercises that would, you would do if somebody had a wrist injury. Then the, the elbow, oh, what would you do here for the elbow? And it had a little... QR code that zapped to a video that showed what you do with elbow, shoulder. It was all the joints of the body, all the things that the students would have, have to master and would be called on to do with real people. And so they could whoop, 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 they could review it if they were in a clinic setting. 
and not be anxious about what the next step should be. So think about what could you hook to your QR codes that you're creating for your students. So I'll ask you here to stop and think and two people who are willing to unmute, unmute. If not, if you don't want to unmute, just go to the chat. Could anybody use a QR code creator? If so, how? Hi, I'm Amber from Oklahoma and I haven't used the QR codes, but I, I could see myself using this with my CNA students uh, for scenarios that I wouldn't have to prompt. So a QR code would ask for their INO yep. or vitals or whatever. So I think this is a great, great idea that I'll definitely put into action. Thank you, Amber. Appreciate it. Everybody give her applause. Yay, virtual applause, Amber. One other, one other example, please. I have an example with my seniors. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, I'm Kathy from Wisconsin. Um, my senior class during their externship, I have them build an online website that's basically their portfolio and then all of their externships and their hours and their mentors reviews and things like that. The QR code is created <clears throat> and then put on their resume mm -hmm. so that when they are applying for jobs, their interviewer can scan the QR code and it can take them to their online website with all of their information, their involvements in high school and um, just everything that they want to have in there. It's, it's been really neat. Kathy, what a great career tool. Give Kathy a hand. Yay. Wow. You're giving them the ability to create things that'll make them marketable. And then the people who are hiring them, you just make it simple for them to access that. Exactly. Thank you, Kathy. Yay. Yay. I see somebody went to Plickers. The free version only lets you do five questions per set or per test. Hey, start with five. See how it goes. I don't know what their prices are like, but I uh, used to use uh, something that starts with a K. Let's see. And they made that really unaffordable during COVID. Um, Kahoot. I used to use Kahoot and the price that went up really, really high. So I uh, substituted Clickers. So evidently they're charging, but I don't know how much. Give it a try for the five that you get. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Clickers is $8.99 a month. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe they'll do you a deal at your school. So since we're talking about price, some people like Mentimeter. I really like Mentimeter. It helped me very much during the pandemic to keep my students involved as you've been involved today. So I want to tell you, I am paying for Mentimeter. I am paying as someone who's not a school educator, $9.99 a month for an unlimited plan, which I think is pretty reasonable for what I do. There is an educator version for people who are in schools that I believe is more like $5 a month for a year. So Mentimeter, I, I do pay for, I do find that a, a good investment. And some of you might have platforms that are paid for by school. So use what you got, use what you got. Let's see if I can get one more idea here on QR codes or no, let's see. I kind of was thinking of an idea if nobody else is. Oh, go for it, go for it. What is it? See if anybody else is muted, but um, I teach my first semester, I teach the, bo the body systems and diseases that can happen to them. So I was kind of thinking this <laughs> and maybe a QR code to show uh, or QR code on a bone. And then mm -hmm. they see pictures of fractures and have to figure out what the fracture was. Oh, nice. Nice. Give a hand. Yay. Yeah. Get them involved and think that, you know, take them up with the level of thinking. What is that? What bone? What does that mean? And there's one more piece of technology that I like, and it is possible to use filters. Now, I don't know how many of you have gone out on a limb to engage your learners, but sometimes, as I said, if the content is dry, I have to find some ways to keep it inviting for my learners. So, you know, there are filters you can use, and I, I use Snap Filter here where I made myself a pickle and I, you actually get to hear the beginning of a little lecture I give as a pickle. 
but you could put a cat on your head. Uh, you could put a mask on your face. Filters allow people to do a variety of things while recording mm. themselves. So I'd like to just show you my example of me as a pickle doing a bit of a lecture. Don't get yourself in a pickle. No, AORN's position statement on patient safety, which is threefold. Number one, all patients have the right to receive the highest quality of perioperative care in every practice setting where operative and other invasive procedures may be performed. Recording in progress. So, so I don't want to tell you. Wait a minute. Get out of it for a minute. I don't want to tell you that some of AORN's uh, materials are dry because they're not. They're very critical and important. But when giving something that's sort of dry, you have to find a way to take it up a level. So I have actually done little tiny mini lectures as a pickle. You can make yourself a potato. Like I said, you can put a cat on your head. You can do whatever. You can use filters. So maybe there's a filter that you can use. And you know, your students are using filters all the time. Maybe there's filters you could use where you could just record a little snippet of you teaching something or doing something to get their attention. Uh, I have a colleague that dresses as Florence Nightingale, real dresses as Florence Nightingale, and she is actually recording herself talking about the history of nursing as Florence Nightingale. I'm not quite that talented, but I certainly can be a pickle. I can use a filter and record myself doing little mini parts of lectures. So, there's my third tip on technology. Use a filter, give it a try. See if there's one that relates to what you're teaching about and see how your students respond because those filters are free. There are apps that allow you to have yourself in a variety of situations you're not in with it as a filter. So crucial educator strategy number five. Use secret reactive motivation when necessary. Look at this saying about a pineapple. When life gives you lemons, <laughs> sell them and buy a pineapple. Oh my goodness, yes indeed. So let me ask you to think about, have you ever, ever had, and for those of you who are new teachers, it'll happen eventually, have you ever had sort of some problem children, some problem learners, some people that make life tough for you to deal with, such as know-it-alls, over-questioners, arguers, um, people who make you want to pull your hair out of your head. So if, if, if you feel confident in how to deal with them, give yourself a green light here. If you're a little bit cautious and you're thinking, hey, I could, I could use a couple of strategies. If you're like, wow, are there really people who are gonna be difficult? Hmm, maybe that's red. Maybe there are some things you can, you can learn because I have some strategies here I wanna share in a few minutes, but I wanna see where everybody is. So statistically, you're gonna run into people who, are not as positive as we want them to be. And indeed, sort of make it hard for us to teach them in ways that we know of. So I'd like to share just some secret strategies that we have to keep to ourselves. So let's see what the experience falls into. How many of you have taught a know-it-all, an over-questioner, the toxic twins, you know, the two negative people that find each other and sit way far away from you, or an arguer or a high attention needs. Which of these do you say to yourself? Yep, yep, indeed, sounds so familiar. Which one? Let's see how the, how the voting turns out here. Split decisions so far. Oh, look, a little bit of them all. <laughs> hmm, yeah, some of us have, have seen more than one of these. 
give you a chance to finish voting here so that we know what majority is. Can't vote, but absolutely. Yes, indeed, in the chat. Mm -hmm. All of the above. Well, it sounds like many of you have had the broad range of experience. I'd like to share some strategies that I've learned the hard way that I call educator secrets that you and I can use when we have some of these people in our classes and we need a new strategy to deal with them. So let's start with the toxic twins. You know, the toxic twins are the ones, again, who find themselves like magnets. They, they are together, they sit in the back as far away from instructor control as possible. So what is a strategy on how to deal with toxic twins? Well, we want to divide and conquer. Or to be positive, we want to mix and match them in a way that looks random. It's not random. It looks random, but it's not random. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is if you leave them sitting together in the back, there's safety and power in numbers. And that's where they're going to try to call all the attention is to them in the back as far away from you as possible. So what I suggest is that you mix your learners up and that you put them in collaborative groups in a way that looks random. It's not random. It just appears to be random. So what I like to do is I like to carry a variety bag of candy. You know how at holiday times like Easter and Halloween, which is coming up, they sell a bag of candy that's got a whole bunch of individual serving variety together in a bag. So what I do is I put some of these in, in my resistor supply kit that I bring to class and I say, okay, now let me figure out who needs to go in what group. And if indeed we're in class when I figure this out, I have it ready for the next class when they come back. But if I want to mix it in the same class, this is what I do. I say, okay, everybody, I'd like for you to go to centers. I'd like for you to do this or that. And I'm going to surprise, give everybody a surprise on their desk. So what I do is I take a sweet tart and I go to the desk of the person who is the most negative and I put a sweet tart there. Then I take a sweet tart, I put it on the most positive student's desk. There it is. I put it on two more student desks where people are positive or smiling. Sweet tart, sweet tart. Then that person's twin, toxic twin, gets a Tootsie Roll. Then I say, who's another really good student? Tootsie Roll. Who's happy people? Tootsie Roll, Tootsie Roll. Then the rest of the class, peppermint, 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 candy kiss, candy kiss, candy kiss, red hots, red hot, red hot. So every student has a candy on their desk. And I say, okay, everybody go to your desk, pick up your present for me. Yay, hold it up and brag. Hey, look what I have, hold it in your hand. Don't sit down, just hold it in your hand up high. All right, now all the people with the same type of candy meet by a wall. So all the peppermints are over here, all the sweet tarts are here, all the candy kisses are here. They're all standing by a wall. Now, I wanna seat my toxic twin two groups in a specific place in my class. I want to place them in the front of the room, my most negative person on my less dominant side. So I am right-handed. So I would want to sit that group. Oh, Tootsie Rolls right over here. Please sit right here. So their group is in the front on my left side. That's my less dominant side. That way I'm not going to have unconscious eye contact with them. I'm going to have to think about looking to the left. Where do I want the toxic twins, twins groups to be. So they're in the front of my left. I want them to be in the front, but way on my extreme right. Not right in front of me, but way over to the right. So I am gonna look like I'm seating them randomly. Oh, Tootsie Rolls right here, right to my left. Oh, Sweet Tarts over here to my right. Oh, all right, we're on two different sides. Now, Peppermint's right here in front of me. Candy Kisses. So you seat people in a way that appears random. It's not. I got one or two more tricks here before I get any further. Doesn't want to show you. It's so secret. It does not even want to show you what it is. So I'm going to have to 
fill in the blanks here. Come on. All right, before we get to over questioner. Ah, here it is. Randomly select your first small group leader. It's not random. So you think about your toxic twins and what characteristics might describe them. So if my toxic twins all have very long hair down to their waist, when everybody's in their groups, I want to say, okay, now we're going to elect the first leader of every small group is going to person you're seated with who has the shortest hair, the person with the shortest hair. So your negative people can't be your first group leader of the small groups. So it's not random how you select the first group leader. It just appears random. It's not random. Then what? Then you have group discussions and the person who reports off from the group discussion is your leader, your good person who's going to filter through any kind of negative comments they've heard. And the peer coordination I found very interesting because it seems to me, tell me if it isn't true for you, that the learners care more what their peers think than what I think. So if the peers in the groups uh, say something, it is received in a different way than if I, the educator, say it. And what I've noticed is this, if you have a really negative person in a group of really positive people, which happens, one of two things occurs, either number one, they change their attitude because they care what their peers think, or they just get quiet. And either way, it's a win. It is. Either way, it's a win. That way, the whole group, the whole class is not aware of who your negative person is, but the people that you put in a small group are. So that's sort of peer coordination. And then there's one other little sneaky secret thing. And that is this, when you're teaching or demonstrating, so I'm gonna stop my share for a minute. When you're teaching or demonstrating, it's really important that you do not make eye contact with your negative toxic twins who are sitting way over here, which is why you put them over there so that you don't make unconscious eye contact with them. Because when you make eye contact with a negative learner, you know what happens. That's when they think you and I have invited them to express their opinion. And they do, as if we, we did that. So what I per, prefer to do when I'm in the front and I'm lecturing or demonstrating, I do not give my negative participants eye contact. I do not. I do not give them eye contact. Now, I give them eye contact when they're coming into class. I give them eye contact during group activities. I give them eye contacts on the way out. I chat with them. I focus on them, but not when I'm up in front of a group of people. Because for some reason, if you just give them un unconscious eye contact, lecturing or demonstrating, that's when they just sort of woof. They attack. They woof. They're on top of it. They're like, oh my gosh, let me jump Miss Deck with that. No, 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 no. So mix and match in a way, and this is really critical, it looks random. It's not random. It's not random at all. But that's our educator secret. We want to keep some good strategies for ourselves. Now let me do one more here before we do a little bit of discussion. Second possible difficult learner is your over questioner. Now, this is not someone who asks good questions. This is not someone who uh, is thoughtful in their questions. This is someone who has asked an abnormal amount of questions. And you're saying, oh, what's that? I have a friend who started teaching in DC and she called me after first class. She was like, I had somebody in my two hour class ask 37 questions. I said, that's kind of an exaggeration. Huh? She said, no, I was making little tick marks. I wasn't able to get through my content. And I said stuff like, oh, that's a great question. Uh, I tell you what, let's give some other people a chance to ask questions. And it didn't, it didn't pan out that way. This person was just hammering, hammering, hammering with 37 questions in two hours. And so this is what I'm talking about, an extreme over questioner. So what do we do with that person? Well, we could use an ask it basket. 
an ASCIT basket. So what's an ASCIT basket? Well, if you have a basket at home, bring it to class. If not, get a brown lunch sack and label it ASCIT basket. You wanna sit your ASCIT basket somewhere central to where your learners are. So it's on a chair, it's on a desk in the middle of the room. You give all of your learners index cards at the beginning of class, you hand out blank index cards. You say, you know what? I want you to ask as many questions as humanly possible. But today we're gonna do it all in writing. So as you have a question, just pick up a blank index card, write the question, the, the answer, the question you have, and then just walk over, drop it in the ask a basket or pass it down and just drop it in the ask a basket. At intervals, I'll go to the ask a basket and I'll answer those questions. So what are some of the advantages of an ask a basket? Well, one advantage is that all the questions are anonymous. So the students who are more quiet feel like they may not be worried about asking a question because they don't have to worry about what their friends will think or what their, their teacher will think. So you get better quality questions. Here's another advantage to an ask a basket. You don't have to get off track. So if you notice two or three questions are being dropped in the ask a basket, you can finish what you're lecturing on and then you can go back to the basket and you can preview them. If one of them pertains to now, say, oh, look, there's three in here. I'll, I'll answer this one now. I'll save the other two till later. What you do, 15 minutes from now, you go back to the basket to answer the one that pertains to the second topic, which is what somebody asked about ahead of time. And you didn't want to get off track anyway, so you just left it in the basket. The third question in there might be one you don't know the answer to. What do you do? Well, you put them in a group activity and you look it up and then you go back to the basket basket. Oh, let me answer this one. What if you end up with more questions in the ask a basket than you can answer during your class time? Well, all you have to do is post the answers in whatever format you usually post answers. Do you want to put it on the door in a document? Do you want to make it available that the students can go to it and see it on, on uh, their homework? Whatever you would like to do, you can post the questions you didn't get to and the answers to them. What I love about an ask a basket is you never lose a question. So sometimes when I'm teaching, if somebody asks me a question and I know I'm going to get to that in a little while, I'll say, oh, that's good. Hold on to that. And then when I'm driving home or when I get in bed at night, I think, oh, man, I didn't go back to that question because I lost it. But if it's in writing, you never lose it. You never lose it in writing. That's a good part. And the other good part is you can keep all those index cards that have questions from your learners and you can shuffle them and you can deal them out to them and they can answer them the second time when it's time for a test review or if you just wanna go over the information to reinforce it another time, they can be the ones answering the question the second, the third, the fourth time, however many times you wanna put it out to your class. So that's an ask it basket. And for an over questioner, somebody who's going to ask 37 questions in two hours, they're not going to write 37 questions. They're not going to do that. They are instead, it's going to filter what they're going to write down. And that's a good thing. Again, that's a good thing. Over questioner. Oh, good. Somebody on the chat. Is, I do a parking lot. Very similar to that. Now, the other good thing about an ask a basket or a parking lot, you know, that thing about we need to change something we're doing or change something they're doing every so often. Think about this. You could teach part of your class. Then ask a basket brings them back. Back to me delivering content. Oh, ask a basket. Let me go to that. So your ask a basket could serve as your way to get a new cup of attention retention. A wonderful, wonderful way to keep them focused and with us. So now let's do high attention needs. High attention needs people. Who are these? These aren't negative people. These are just your learners who need a lot of attention. And they're the ones who are like, oh, oh, Miss Deck, can I tell you what happened to my mother? Oh, oh, Miss Deck, can I tell you about my dog? Oh, 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 you're talking about this disease. I think I'm having that symptom. Oh, oh, Miss Deck. That's what I mean by a high attention needs person. Not somebody who's negative, like your toxic twin, but someone who just needs a bunch of attention. So I have two strategies I use with people who have, who have high attention needs. Here's the first one, volunteer room coordinator. So the minute that I know I have a high attention needs person, I'll go to them when everybody else is involved in an activity 
either right before class or at the end of class, and I'll say this to them. I am so excited you are here in my class. Would you volunteer to be the room coordinator? I need you to do some special jobs that'll be really helpful to me and everybody in the class. Do you think you'd be willing to do that? Now, what do you think your high attention needs person is gonna say? Yes, yes. So I say, okay, I'm going to announce it to the class that you're the room coordinator, so hang on. So everybody finishes their activity. They sit down, I say, everybody, hey, let's give a round of applause to Brittany. Yay, why Brittany? Because she volunteered to be the room coordinator. Are you hot? Tell her she opens the door. Are you cold? Tell her she closes the door. I just gave her a basket. In this basket, there's highlighters, there's post-it notes, there's breath mints, there's Kleenexes, there's Band-Aids, there's some first aid items if you need them. Whatever it is, just wave her over. Hey, Britt, over here, over here. And she'll bring it to you and then give her a big thank you. And Britt, I'm going to have you hand out some, some blank paper here. Some, so keep your high attention needs person busy helping you with things that help everybody so that they get a lot of attention, not just from us, but from their peers. Now, what if that doesn't work? <laughs> what if they're still trying to interrupt you? Oh, oh Miss Deck, oh, Miss Deck. Then you can move to the next level, which is specialty pasta, specialty pasta. So let me explain what specialty pasta is and how I use it, because this might be an idea that's helpful to you too. So I don't know if you've ever seen, but there are some places, not grocery stores, that sell specialty pasta. I last found some in a Hallmark store. I know those are harder to find nowadays, but this pasta was in the shape of Santa in a sleigh. There's some pasta that's the shape of uh, snowflakes. There's some pasta in the shape of sports teams. You can find all of this online. Buy yourself a bag of specialty pasta, something that no student can get their hands on but you. So what I do is I'd get envelopes and I'd write my student names on the envelopes. And in each envelope, there'd be two pieces of pasta. And I hand it out at the beginning of the semester. And I say, you know what? I want everybody to be as involved as possible. So this is called your two cents worth. If you have a story you want to tell about your family, your dog, whatever, just take a piece of pasta out of the envelope and hold it up so I can see it. When I see the pasta, I'll come and collect it from you and it will buy 60 seconds of air time. Now I have the timer set on my phone. So you'll have 60 seconds to tell us that story, to uh, tell us your thoughts, to editorialize, whatever you want. You have 60 seconds of uninterrupted air time. When your two pieces of pasta are spent, your air time is up. So please spend wisely. So what happens is the more quiet students are encouraged to give their life experience, to tell their stories, and the over talkers only get two shots at it. Now, I've had some teachers say to me, gee, Michelle, you know, don't they ever give their friends their pasta? No, these are the extreme talkers where even their friends are looking at you like, oh, please get them to stop talking. So I give out pasta a couple times in the year, depending on <laughs> how, how much is spent. But that way, your high attention needs person has to prioritize with which two, which two are they telling in this number of weeks? Everybody else is encouraged as well. So that's some high attention needs tips, some ideas. So what I'd like to do right now, if you're willing, is to get out your official timing device, whatever that might be. Because it's really important that at some point we take care of biology, which means take in fluids, uh, expel fluids, get a snack, raise your blood sugar, whatever you need to do, move around. So I'm doing a little bit of math here on my uh, cheat sheet of paper. So this is what I'd like to do. My phone says it's 39 minutes after the hour. So we are going to start back at exactly 54 minutes after the hour. And if you are here 54 minutes after the hour, I'm going to spin the wheel of fortune. And one of you, if you can prove you're here 
by saying something or turning on your camera, you will win a gift card. Yes, indeed, a gift card is available. So I will see you at 54 minutes after the hour. Exchange fluids, move around, get a snack. Now's the time.
us to I'm going to move us to the wheel of numbers. Let's see who's winning a gift card. Now we're gonna have to count. So Nancy, you might have to help me counting here. Let's see which numbers you want a gift card. 53. So let's go down our roster on our uh, Zoom and find out who's number 53. Come on, let's look. Let's look at our participant list. 53. Does it does it number them? Well, you just have to count down. Okay. When you look at the participants, who are they? Okay. Oh, let's see. Not in the chat, but in the participants. I'll close out the chat. Hmm. Let's see if it's easier to do it this way. 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, mm -hmm. 51, 2, 3, that's Sheila Durham. Sheila, are you here? If you can unmute yourself or maybe even show us your face, definitely unmute yourself. Sheila, are you here? You're number 53 on my list. Sheila? Are you here, Sheila? Hmm. Is it time to go back to the wheel? Because I haven't heard from Sheila. Has anybody heard Sheila? I think you got good. Did you? No, yes. no, wait, wait, wait. You hear me now? I hear you, Sheila. Yay! Oh, my Sheila, goodness. Sheila. Okay, I'm on my phone, so it's a little different than a computer. Okay, that was what so else? Close. Okay, this is what you need to do. You need okay. to write down this phone number, 504-914-1400. Okay. Do you see that in the camera? I do. All right. Write down that phone number. You are uh -huh. going to text me your mailing address. Wherever you want me to put in the U.S. Postal Service mail your gift card. And it's, Great. it's going to come to whatever dress you would like to send me. And uh, you can enjoy using that gift card on whatever you would like to have. So there you go. Yay. Wonderful. Thank you very you much. You were madly oh, trying thank to you. unmute. Huh, Sheila? You were madly trying to. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I've had that happen to me. I okay. Have indeed have that happen. So thank you. So it's your lucky day today. Yay. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy. So let me come back to Mentimeter. I'm going to move my wheel out of the way. And that was pickerwheel.com. That's another free one. There's also the wheel of names I've used when I have um, a smaller number of participants in my class. So let's come back. We ended with high attention needs learners. Let's see who's next. Ah, the know-it-all. Look at that. We have SpongeBob looking very, very much like a know-it-all. So. What do I mean by know-it-alls? Because to me, there's two classifications of know-it-alls in the world. There are some people you and I teach who may have, for whatever reason, uh, had experience with things and know more than your average person would. I mean, sometimes that's possible. But sometimes a know-it-all is someone who really doesn't know anything. They just want to appear as if they know things. I personally use the same strategy, no matter whether I have a know-it-all that appears to know stuff or doesn't. So let me explain it. So I'll go to this person when no one else is listening and I'll say, I am so thrilled you are in my class. It's obvious to me, you have some extra knowledge about infection control. So let's do this. In a little while, I'm gonna have the rest of the students come up with what are the toughest infection control questions they can think of. So they're gonna make up tough questions and you and I are going to take turns answering them, but we're gonna have a signal. So let me show you my signal. If I touch my ear like this, my earlobe, my earring, it means, do you know the answer? If you do, you touch your earlobe, I say, Oh, okay, and now Stella will answer that question. If you don't know the answer, don't touch your earlobe. I won't put you on the spot. It's okay, it's all right, that's our signal. I do this, it means 
Would you like to answer it? If you want to answer it, you touch your earlobe. I say, Stella, take it from here. If you don't know the answer, it's okay. Keep your arms down by your side. I won't put you on the spot. So what this does is it gives me a signal that controls when that person is jumping in or out. And it also gives that person a choice as to whether or not they want to answer the question. So let's say somebody comes up with the question, how far do fecal spores travel in a restroom if you flush a toilet in a public restroom that doesn't have a top? And so I touch it, Stella touches the ear. Stella, how far? Up, up to eight feet, which is gross but true. Yay, thank you, Stella. All right, yay, that's correct. So have a signal with them so that they have a choice about whether or not to answer. Now, I have found that the know-it-alls that I have taught over the years, some people do really have some good knowledge and experience. And that became our ongoing signal about you know, when they would jump in and answer things. I have had know-it-alls where they've never answered a question. They've never touched their ear. And that's okay too. I think what they want is acknowledgement from us. Oh, I see you know a lot about this. Would you like to help me answer the tough questions? And that way we validate to them that we're listening to what they're having to say. Whether or not they answer a question is irrelevant. All right, so what if? What if I touch my ear? Stella, how far do fecal spores travel? And she says, up to 10,000 feet. So we all know that's wrong. Do I go, ah, wrong? No. I said, wow, Stella, that sounds kind of high. What would I do if I was a nurse and I was working in an area where I didn't know an answer? I'd, I think I'd look it up and double check it. So let's all right now look it up and see how far. It, and let's see what sources, you know, is it Wikipedia? No, we don't want that. Is it the CDC? Oh yeah, there's a good one. So you could teach people how to access answers to questions that your know-it-all may not be on the money with just a way that I have that signal. And I know it sounds weird, but this didn't happen. I had one class where I was teaching uh, a variety of age people who are going back to nursing school. So I had some people with some life experience. And this one person that I had had been in the military, had been a medic, and she had so much knowledge that she could you know, share stories and stuff that I started our own little signal. This is what it was. I'd put my hair behind my left ear. That's what I'd do. That was my signal to her because we were both females. Would you like to take it from here? And she would put her hair behind her ear. I'd say, okay, tell us about it. It was, it was great. But on the class evaluation at the end of the semester, two people, not one, two people said, Michelle, you may be unaware you have an odd tick. At intervals, you put your hair behind your left ear and you may want to watch that in the future. So they didn't even know that was our signal. And that's the point. If you and I have some educator secrets of how we can handle the and manage our know-it-all, we only want to know that with our know-it-all. We don't want the rest of the class to know that that's our arrangement. So you might want to give that one a try. It's possible. So have a signal collaborate with them. They have the choice whether or not they want to come with us and add to our answers. And then of course, the famous arguer. Look at this dog. It's barking, 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 barking. So what do I do when I have an arguer with me in front of class? Well, the first thing I do is I become an expert listener and I start listening and listening and listening until I hear a teeny tiny itty bitty seed of good. And when I hear an itty bitty teeny tiny seed of good, I seed of good, I grab it and I go down the road as if it was meant as something good for all of us. That's what I do. I listen, I grab a seed of good, I go down the road with that. I'll give you an example in a minute. So I redirect what they're saying to the best intention of all of the class. That's what I'm doing. I'm redirecting it so that it's a good thing for everybody. And yes, it does take practice to do this. So now what? So now I have a little story about an arguer in an extreme situation, at least for me. The worst arguer I've ever had was not in a classroom, they were at a conference. 
that I was speaking at. 600 people at a big faculty conference. Uh, I believe it was in Orlando. Never forget the meeting room I was in. I was asked to do a 60 minute presentation on creative ways to teach CPR, which I've done many, many times. And so I was up there, I was about 30 minutes into it and somebody ran to the microphone in the center aisle of the big convention room. You know, the one they put there for questions at the end. So I was about 20 minutes into it and this person came up and said, stop, wait, stop, stop, wait. And I said, yes, what is it? She said, my name is Judy and it is ridiculous that you'd be telling us to teach CPR in creative ways. We don't have time. Let me be a little clearer. We don't have time. So what I did was I grabbed the tiny seat of good she gave me, time. And I took it down the road as if it was the best thing I had ever heard. I said this, I said, Judy, what a great point you brought up time. How many of the rest of you in here feel like you don't have enough time when you're teaching CPR to do something creative? Raise a hand. Well, about 90% of the people raise their hand. I said, would it be helpful if I were to share with you three strategies you could use that would give you five minutes in CPR to do something creative? People were like, yeah, yeah, that'd be good. I'm like, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. Here are three strategies you could do to find five minutes in CPR to do something creative. So what happened? She sat down and it was over. So I grabbed time and I went off down the road as if it was a good thing. Now, sometimes you have to spin or restate what your learner is saying for it to become something positive. So what does that mean? Well, you know, my example with the balls, I did that for a group of faculty in a college in New York. And one of those faculty members, who I was warned about ahead of time, decided he wanted to argue with me in front of all the class. And so after the, the rock ball bounced higher than any other ball, he stood up and he said, Michelle has deceived us. And we came here in good faith and we thought she was gonna be straight with us, but she has deceived us into thinking that that rock was a rock and not a Super Bowl. And so he's going on. So I'm trying to get him to give me something. She has deceived us. He said that word like three different times. So I grabbed deceive because he didn't give me any other seat. Grabbed the seed and spun it around and said, oh, how many of you perceived this was really a rock? How many of you perceived that? Huh? Lots of people had their hands up. Do students ever misperceive you? Would it be helpful if I shared with you three strategies you could use when students misperceive you? Yes, okay, hey, thank you so much. So I actually had to take what, what that person said and turn it into the most positive statement of what it was because I wanted to go down the road to the greater good of the class. That's always our job as educators. The greater good of the class is what we're going for. I'm gonna get back to arguer in a minute, but a, a dear friend and experienced educator gave me this piece of advice. When I first started teaching and I had arguers or negative people who wanted to fight with me, I used to give them a lot of my attention. I used to spend a lot of time trying to change their minds. I was just, oh, this person, I'm gonna invest a lot in them. And you know what? It didn't always work. But what did happen when I spent all that attention on one person is the other 25 people in the class got nothing because I had invested it all in that one person who it didn't make a difference to. And as a, a, a wise educator, my friend Doug said to me, Michelle, you have to flip that. You have to spend your energy on 25. And that one, you give individual attention to not in front of the 25. You can still invest in that person. Just flip it. Don't give them eye contact. Don't feed the negativity. Work for the greater good of everybody. And it changed how I taught because my quote unquote natural response was to just just spend a lot of time and attention on that person. And what I, what I discovered, and I know all of you know from psychology and the real world, what gets rewarded gets repeated. What gets attention gets repeated. So I want to reinforce with my attention the good things that happen so that those are more likely to happen. 
One more thing with arguers, there, there is a little bit more other than listen, listen, listen. Grab the seat of good and go down the good road. So redirect to good, yes, that's important. What else? Keep your body language open and positive throughout that. Because you know, it would have been easy for me to go, thanks, Judy, here are three ways you can find five minutes in a CPR class to do something creative. No, you have to keep your body language open and positive. And that's what you need to practice. Practice that with, with your friends, with your family, practice keeping your body language open and positive. So the strategy I use to make that happen is I play a little game in my mind. And this is the game I play. Wow, Judy is making me a better teacher than I've ever been. Nobody's ever raised this question. This is the best thing that ever happened. Wow, this is terrific. That's the game I play in my head. And when I play that game in my head, my body language follows that. This is wonderful. This is terrific. I tell myself that, I convince myself of that for that one moment in time. Now, when class is over, it's a whole different situation. I'm on the phone with my husband, <laughs> Judy Bluff, 600 people, oh no. Yeah, I can, I can do that later. But while I'm there, I have to tell myself, this is great. This is a question that's never come up. This is gonna be a better class. I just give myself that pep talk. Now, Someone once said to me, that's, that's acting. I don't know. I've never taken an acting class, but I do know this. I do know the strategy that I'm sharing with you. Share, just play that little game in your head. Is a strategy that is used by a billion dollar company worldwide. They teach that to everyone who works for them. Play a little game in your head. So go to the, go to the chat and guess which billion dollar company in the world teaches people to play a game in their head every day at work. Who is it? Yes, I'm seeing Google, Amazon, Disney, Apple, Disney, Apple. Yep, go ahead, put it in the chat. I'm seeing what's there. Because I can tell you, I know for sure, one of you is correct. And it's the Walt Disney Company. And the reason I know that is because a friend of mine, Len Milbauer, is pretty high up in Disney training and development. And he and I have had this discussion. He said to me, you know, Michelle, everyone who comes to work at Disney plays a role. We give them a role. They come to, uh, there is no uh, ma uh, employment office. There's central casting. And when they walk in, we say, here's the role that you will play. Uh, please read through that. Do you think you can play that role? I said, Lynn, I think that's true for people who play Mickey Mouse and Goofy and Cinderella, but uh, come on, real jobs? Come on, be, be real, Lynn. He was like, no, people who do real jobs, they play a role, uh, uh, the role of somebody doing that job. I said, I don't know about this. He said, go into the Magic Kingdom and test them. So I did, and I went into the Magic Kingdom and I found a gentleman in a blue jumpsuit zipped up the front and I watched him for 20 minutes. He scraped gum off the ground. He had a little blade on a, what looked like an extendable pointer and he was scraping gum off the ground, scraping, scrape, scrape, scrape. I went, I tapped him on the shoulder after watching him for 20 minutes. I said, excuse me, sir, are you a groundskeeper here at Disney? Do you scrape gum off the ground to make a living? And he looked up. And he had a big smile on his face and he said, oh no, ma'am, I am an environmental magician. And I'd like for you to look at the beauty and the magic that I get to help create every day. Have a magical day. And then he took a mop and he started mopping on the ground and he was doing Mickey Mouse ear shapes on the ground. And I thought to myself, you know what? If this guy can convince himself he's an environmental magician, I can probably convince myself I'm an educator because it's less of a jump. It is. Think about it, folks. It's less of a jump. So what I say to myself is every day that I get up and I teach, I put on my educator shoes and I play the role of educator and I act like an, an effective educator. And that role is different from the role of mother, sister, aunt, friend uncle, father, it's 
teacher, it's an educator. And there are certain things that I do as an educator that I would never do in my regular civilian life. There are certain skills that I've had to master because I'm an educator. And the only way to do that is to practice it, to do it more and more and more and more. So for example, now I've been, I've been an educator for a lot of years. I've been teaching full-time for 38 years. Longer than that part-time, but full-time, 38 years. And I've had to learn to do a couple things that are outside my comfort zone, just like I ask my learners to do things outside their comfort zone. Here's one. I am not a people person. What? You're not a people person? No. In the continuum of humans, over here we have people, people, friendly people who like to chat and talk, aren't afraid of strangers. And then on this side of the continuum, we have our analytical thinking people who don't like touchy-feely stuff, who are really shy, that don't find it easy to talk to strangers. That's like the people continuum. You know where I am when I'm not educating? I'm over here. I'm doing Sudoku puzzles in a corner by myself at the Christmas party. I'm, I'm afraid of humans. I'm scared to death. The hardest thing I ever do on the first day of having a group is stand at the door, meet them and talk to them. Oh my gosh, that is not a natural talent I have. But guess what? I've had to learn to teach like a people person. I've had to learn, it's more tiring for me to do people related stuff. So for those of you who are naturally shy, you can learn the role of people person. If you're a people person, guess which end you have to learn? You have to learn the analytical thinking people, the people who are quiet, the, the, the Sudoku puzzle thinkers. You have to learn how to think like that too because we have to teach everybody. <sighs> so yes, indeed, we have to learn to stretch ourselves. And it may be funny or it may not be. But the first time my husband ever saw me teaching a group of people, he came in, he slipped in the back. And at the end, when I was picking up all of my teaching stuff, getting ready to leave, he said, who was that woman? And what did you do to my wife? Who was that? I said, oh, that's Michelle, the educator. He was like, can I bring her to the Christmas party? I was like, nope, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Michelle, the educator gets tired because I'm stretching muscles I never had before. I am. So I would suggest to you that whatever your strength is, use it, but practice the things that are not. Practice. And I'll tell you, it's harder for me to practice those skills on my family than it is in a classroom for me to let that go by. Because believe me, if any of my three wonderful daughters were to speak to me like some arguers have, it wouldn't be the same discussion in the same way that I just modeled for you. It would be a, excuse me, do you think you're talking to someone who is not your mother, right? Because, yeah, that's not gonna happen. So arguer, arguer, hopefully some strategies have happened that you say to yourself, hey, maybe I could try one of those, play a little game in my head. What do I have to lose? So now that I've shared some strategies, do you think you might maybe with the stoplight be where you were before or might there be a strategy or two you could try? So that if you were red, maybe now you're yellow or yellow, maybe now green, or if you're green, well, you're living there, but maybe you heard something good too. So I'll give you a minute to give some feedback here. And you can also put some stuff in the chat because I'm getting a peek at that as well. Now, all the strategies that I shared with you there, I've learned them all the hard way. And I have had some wonderful mentors who have helped me and guided me. And I would suggest you do that for each other too. Because indeed, indeed we have each other to help. There's one other little skill that I've found helpful for those of us in health science, and it's this. For those of us who have dealt with the public in healthcare, we do have a healthcare face. If I go into a room and I pull the sheets back and I see nothing but blood, I can't be like, ah, ah, what? Nope. 
I have a nursing face I can put on that's like, hmm, hmm, get some help, blah, blah. You know, using that particular ability with your learners is a good thing. You and I have experienced not necessarily showing our feelings that are extreme in front of people, which is good. It's good in a class to not be like, ah, what am I going to do with this student, right? Not everybody who teaches has learned that skill. So I see in the chat, people are continuing to learn. Good, good. So those are reactive strategies. So it's time for a little bit of competition, folks. So if you would like to compete to win a gift card, uh, now's the time on Menti for you to give me some answers. If you haven't been on Menti yet, you can go to www.menti.com and use the code at the top, or I'll even give you the QR code, zap it again. You wanna zap it to do a little bit of friendly competition. Never hurts to do a little bit of competition to show that we've learned. I'm sure some of you do some friendly competition with your learners too. Yep, parallel use in healthcare, everything we do in class, very nice. Thank you for that comment. So yes, you get to pick yourself a icon here to represent you in the next couple of questions. Ooh, a bunny, a bee, a lion, a fish. Okay, here we go. Of course, faster answers get more points. Learning retention is built how? How is it built? With interaction and repetition, by reading textbooks or with long lectures? Which of those do you think is the best and fastest way to build learner retention? Is it with interaction and repetition, by reading textbooks or with long lectures? Time's up. What are your answers look like? Oh, look at that. Yep, 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 whoop, whoop. 53 got that correct. Yes, it is with interaction and repetition. Let's see the second question. One way to proactively motivate is to offer what? Adult advice, a negative consequence, or a benefit shopping list? Hmm, a benefit shopping list? I wonder what that is. Adult advice, a negative consequence, a benefit shopping list. Time's up. It is indeed a benefit shopping list. Now you're saying, Michelle, you didn't even tell us about a benefit shopping list. So at this point, I would like to share with you a benefit, what this even is. A benefit shopping list is when you and I take an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, we draw a line down the center vertically. And on the left side of the page, we put all the things our learners are going to learn in our classes. And on the right hand side, we list all the wonderful things that they will achieve if indeed they learn what we teach them. Oh, be able to make money, be able to buy a car, be able to have professional colleagues, be able to help my family if they get sick, be able to you can create a benefit shopping list of 10 to 12 things that your students will gain if indeed they learn what you're teaching them, which is the left side of the paper. The right side of the paper is which of these would you like to gain? Which of these? Be sure it's in teenager language. Oh, I'll be able to help my friends. Oh, I'll be able to make money. Oh, I'll be able to be in a profession that helps people, whatever it is. Give out your benefit shopping list at the beginning of class. Say to them, okay, time to shop. Look down the right-hand side. Which of these do you, do you like? Which of these would you like to have? Which of these is important? Have them circle it and then collect it. At the end of the semester, pull it back out. Say, oh, this is what you said you wanted to gain from our class at the beginning. Now, let's see where you are. What have you learned that'll help you to get there? How is this class going to help you with that? And have them see motivation, what they've gained from your class. You've created a choice. The choice is which of these 10 or 12 good things do you want to gain? Which ones? And you know, people like choices. People like to make decisions. All right. So let's move to our next question. That is a benefit shopping list. So a little bit of 
explanation. I made you curious what it was. Here's question three. One way to reactively motivate is to keep them with their friends, let them sit anywhere they want, or mix them up, divide and conquer. Hmm. How? What would a reactive way to motivate be? What would you and I do? Let's see what people think. Yep, 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 yep. Proactive motivation. We do things differently. Reactive is when we have problem children, problem learners, problem students. So let's see. Let's see who's at the top of the leaderboard. Here come the scores. So ping you, you have to unmute and tell me who you are. What is your name? P-I-N-G-U. Because you're going to get a gift card, but you have to tell me who you are. I know you're here because you're playing. Unmute, please. Or start madly typing in the chat if your, <laughs> your device doesn't have sound. I'm not hearing anything. P I N G U, the little penguin. Who is that? Who is that? I'm stopping my share so I can see. It. Nobody's taken taken uh, ownership of their penguin because they won. They won. They got the most points. They got the most correct answers the quickest. Is it me? And did you? Yeah, it could be. It could be if you pick the little penguin. And look, here's the phone number, 504-914-1400. Yep, you have a penguin icon, and it's you. So you're going to text me your mailing address, and I'm going to send you a gift card through the U.S. Postal Service. Yay, everybody give Anne virtual applause. Yay, yay, all right. Very nice. So thank you, Anne. A little bit of friendly competition. So crucial educator strategy number six, expand your teaching strategies to include all three major learning styles. Yep. Even if you have a favorite, it's best to be able to teach in all three styles. Now, let me say this, whether you want to debate the validity of learning styles or not, each person has a way that takes less time and energy than the other two. Can we all learn in all three? Of course we can. But all of us have a favorite that takes less time and less energy for us to learn. So let's jump in here a bit. So I know somebody said, it's dangerous, Michelle, for people on a webinar to close their eyes. No, I'm willing to, to chance it. So do me a favor and for just the next minute or two, close your eyes until I tell you to open them. So please close your eyes. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word apple, apple, apple? Open your eyes. So go ahead and vote here. What's the first thing that came to your mind? It, was it a picture of something? Could have been a picture of anything. Were you experiencing something? Was it a sense experience? You were touching, you were biting, you were tasting, you were moving, you were touching. Or did you just see typed words like on a slide? Apple or apple, apple, apple. Or there was no picture in your brain. It was just sort of black darkness and you focused on the hearing. What is it for you? Go ahead and vote. So put it in the chat if you're not on Menti with me, please. Let's 
single we got. All right. We have some words, some pictures, some experience. Peanut butter. Oh, yeah, must be snack time. That goes with apple, apple, apples, doesn't it? So peanut butter is a sense experience. Yay. So let me explain to you. I asked that simple question. What's the first thing that came to your mind when I, that comes to your mom when I say the word apple? So uh, if you had a picture of something, guess what, folks? Uh, your brain, fastest, easiest, simplest, your primary style is visual. That's it. So the best way and easiest way to teach you is with lots of videos and pictures and letting you watch and visual, 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 visual. That's the easiest way. And you know, if you had a learner, if you had somebody who was struggling, you could say, close your eyes. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word? And you can pick a word. I like apple. You can pick one. Say it three times and see what happens to them. So if your primary style is visual, you know, I like to see things. I have to watch somebody do it first, or I like to see a video or, okay, visual. What about the other two questions that came up? Were you having a sense experience? If so, your primary style is hands-on or kinesthetic. Were you moving an apple? Were you juggling an apple? Were you eating apple pastry? Were you biting into an orange? Did you see a worm? Seeing a worm would put you into visual. Biting into a worm would make you kinesthetic. Touching a worm would be kinesthetic. The color red, the general sensation of red is kinesthetic. So that means you like to be doing things. Get out any and all equipment, get out any and all props, your basket of babies, your um, weakest think envelopes, whatever, get out something and put it in people's hands. So if they're having a sense experience, they're kinesthetic. What was that third category? Come on, what was that? It was auditory. Did you see type words, Apple, or just blankness with the sound of the word? Then your primary style is auditory. Now, auditory people like lecture. They tend to remember what people tell them, and they even love to read. They love words. They're all about words. They, they like textbooks. They like to read in their free time. That's the primary style, auditory. Auditory people tend to like traditional things in class, such as lectures and textbooks. Ooh, I saw a red apple. Then you are visual if you saw a red apple. So when you use that, this little question, this little test on your learners, if you have, do it one-on-one, -on -one, somebody who's struggling, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word apple, apple, apple? When they give you your prim their primary style, you can direct what's gonna work for them. So let me say this, you know and I know, the kinesthetic people sometimes feel like they can't sit still or like they need things in their hands or that that's the way they learn. My youngest daughter is kinesthetic and the way she had to you, learn math was with beans and little teddy bears and we move things around. She learned all of American history by making chairs up with her arms and legs. And now I watch her with her daughter who, oh my gosh, reminds me, my granddaughter reminds me of my daughter so much. And she gets frustrated with her. And I say, why are you frustrated? She was you at that age. You want her to learn uh, math? Get out the beans and the little teddy bears. You want her to learn, uh, you know, history of Louisiana? She's going to make up cheers. So my granddaughter is learning the capitals of the 50 states using cheers because that's how her mother's teaching her. And you know what? That's how she best learns too. So think to yourself, you might have a favorite, but your learners may not like your favorite. They want all three modes. So think to yourself, how can they see it? How can they hear it? How can they read the text? How can I put something in their hands? How can they have the experience of it? What can you do to make that possible? So, yep, we need to reach all styles, not just our favorite. We all know that. So, this is the actual question that I asked. If anybody wanted to 
copy it down or take a snapshot of it or whatever. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word apple? And I even said word, but so few people see words. So more people see visual or have a sense experience than those of us who just see words. So that's pretty much a 60 second learning style assessment. Do they have the assessments that are much longer and much more detailed? Of course they do. Of course there are more detailed, but that's, that's pretty much one that I wanna share with you that's simple, that's easy. So before we go any further, before I get to my crucial educator, oh yeah, we'll come back here. So what I wanna do is I wanna stop my share for a minute and talk about some kinesthetic methods that you and I can use to teach people to reinforce information and to re-engage our learners. So one of the easiest and simplest activities that I like to do is what's called an aerobic quiz or a true false quiz, where the choice is either true or false or yes or no. And I like to do it in a way that the students will have to move as part of that lesson. So an aerobic quiz works like this. You have your learner stand up. So I'm picking up my computer. Stand up and face the front of the room with the back of their legs touching the front of their chair or the desk chair. Now, I'm gonna ask a series of yes, no questions. If the answer is yes or true, they remain standing. If the answer is false or no, they touch their seat to the chair and they stand back up. That's what they have to do. So they touch their seat to the chair and they stand back up. So true, remain standing, false, they touch their seat to the chair. So let me stand up, you can tell I'm standing. So here's the first question, is your heart beating? You should all be standing, hopefully. All right, here's question number true. True or false? True, we remain standing, false, we sit down. The best and easiest way to teach Okay, it looks like we lost Michelle for a minute when she was standing up. So we know she's gonna sign right back on here. They must have thought that her heart was gonna stop beating. I guess so. Or maybe her heart did stop. What? Uh -huh. Okay, I'm looking to see if I have a text from her. I'm going to, I'm going I'm to check in the waiting room too. Good, because they didn't want me to finish. <laughs> I, you could have, Karen, you could have finished. I don't oh, know. What, what happened was I was doing an aerobic quiz and I stepped on something and turned off the electricity to everything, to the computer, <laughs> to the light, <laughs> to the room, to, the, to my house over there. My dog just went running. So wow, what an aerobic quiz. It was so enthralling that I was up, down, and all around. Thank you, Karen. Oh, that's something you would do, says Patek. Yes, it happens, doesn't it? It doesn't. So uh, were you having some great group discussion while I was gone, Karen? We, you know, we were having some great group discussions. And then I was going to, looking at my bookshelf and going, oh, look, there's my direct book with Michelle's notes from a couple of years ago. I would have just gotten that out and just started just, reading from there. <laughs> so I guess it's not meant to do an aerobic quiz modeled, but know, you can but do it in your class. Up, down, up, down, yeah. up, down, true, false, true, false. You can see who indeed is understanding because they're moving. They're moving. They're either standing up or they're sitting down. One of the other things that I like to do that involves kinesthetics is this. Let's see if you remember it. What does this mean? What's that? What did we do? What was that? Anybody change remember? It up. Change it up. Yes, change something I'm doing, change something they're doing. 
Is there any kind of thing that you could teach your learners that would reinforce that could be some movement that they do? Is there some principle that you like to do and like to have that you could reinforce with them? One thing I like to do that reinforces the message is a drum roll. So can any of you take your hands and start a drum roll? Start a drum roll wherever you are, drum roll. The number one way of preventing the spread of infection is drum roll, hand washing. So I have them drum rolling when I'm trying to make a point about something that I want them to remember. So kinesthetically, hands on, how can we get people involved in what indeed will cement it in their brain. The other thing that I like to do that's kinesthetic and hands-on is I like to have a bag of teaching supplies. So you know how I said, have the weakest thing, have a basket of babies, person, put that all in little bags and have your group leaders come up and get a bag and take it back to their group. And then they have everything they're gonna need during class. And then at the end of class, that person also has to bring it back up to you. Because sometimes when you and I use props, the students want to keep them, but we want to reuse them. So if you make it a habit of having a bag of props, you give it out at the beginning of the class to one person on a team who's responsible for bringing it back to you. And at the end, they bring it back to you. You won't have to keep recreating these things over and over and over again. Plus, you always know who's in charge because they have the bag in front of them. And there are a variety of fun gift bags that you can always find at dollar stores, which can be productive and helpful. So before we go back to the slides, I'd like to ask if three people would unmute and just tell me your thoughts about hands-on ways to teach. How have you taught? What do you think of some of the examples I've shared? And have you seen it powerful for your learners? So let's have a little bit of the discussion here since the power has reset things. Hey, okay. um, maybe Nina or would want to tell us about the skeleton dance. Oh, let's hear, please, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. We can. Yes, when I teach, for example, the skeletal system in Health Science 1, uh, they, um, I'm sharing this with you because my students, even towards the end of the semester, so say, can we dance, skeleton dance? You know, if you search it on YouTube, it's a skeleton dance, kind of like more elementary, but you said like you put your hands on, you know, your right foot uh, front and left foot on, it'll touch your uh, different parts of the body, then actually you reinforcing those different types of the body system, especially the skeleton part. So that actually let them get up and then they dance and they love that song. And it became also so much so that we have like some competitive events that's going to be like a consequence. So if you, if you don't win, you're going to do the skeleton dance. Uh oh, so they become very, very competitive because they don't want to do that. But they remember that every time until the end of the semester. Can we do skeleton dance? So I try to, to, to Google that on YouTube. It's actually very, you know, it's fun for the students. Very, very nice. Give a hand. Yay. Very nice. Wonderful. Please share. Let's hear some other good examples. Hi, this is Karen Hayes. I'm from Oklahoma. Um, I do a lot of kinesthetic learning in my classroom because I myself am that way uh, and teach pre-nursing to high schoolers. So I make a, we do a cell project and um, they're allowed to use any type of crafting materials that I have in the classroom. And they usually have a base of uh, an umbrella or a hula hoop. So they're quite large. And Ooh. then they have to put the cell, uh, a cell together, label it. And then they have a report as a team project that they give um, to the class. So we are uh, doing those things to teach each other. And then we hang them up in the classroom from the ceiling so that they can be proud of, of what they've done. So that's one of the things I do. I do a lot of things, but that's one. Yay. Thank you, Karen. Hooray. Do we have a third? These are terrific. Um, I'm Courtney. I'm from uh, uh, Washington and this last year was my first year teaching. So the just trying to 
learn everything was a struggle because I did not come from a teaching background. Um, but the biggest thing that I noticed is realizing that they are still just kids. And the more I could get them, like I went and bought, you know, cheap Play-Doh and they absolutely love it. Like, even if some kids are done with their work and they're like, Hey miss, can I use the Play-Doh? Like, and it cracked me up because you're thinking of them in these like 16, 17, 18 year olds. And, but they like loved any chalk or Play-Doh. So um, I tried to do that with a lot of things. I teach a sports medicine and then a HEMA body systems and any, I have big um, lab tables and any time I could let them draw on the lab tables um, with the chalk, or we actually got some chalkboard markers that work really good. Cause I do have like the chalkboard lab tables. Um, anytime I let them do that or do with the Play-Doh or anything like that, they were just ecstatic and it cracked me up watching them and I just didn't expect it. But once I saw it, I was like, yes, this is definitely uh, something that I'm going to continue to use any chance I can get. Wow. Let's give applause. Yay. Very, very nice. Let me... I'm making notes about what everybody's saying. I want to share three that came to me through uh, South Carolina. And Nancy, when I first started teaching the health science teachers in South Carolina, they shared with me what the best practices they were doing. And probably all of you do this, but I want to share three of them that just came to me since we're talking about this. The first one had to do with circulation to the heart. So I met a health science educator who said to me, you know, they gave me one class to teach this and I lectured on it and the students are really confused. So I actually am gonna have to take another class to do it even though I'm not supposed to. And please help me, Michelle, please help me. I just, I, I've never taught before, I need some help. So what we did was we went to a store and we bought a flat double bed sheet. And on that with markers, we drew the four chambers of the heart, the valves between them, the vessels that came in, the vessels that went out, one lung off to the side. And she said, well, what am I gonna do with this? I said, well, what you're gonna do at the beginning of class is you're gonna, for a little review, say, where are the, you know, what are the components of blood? Oh, red cells. Okay, who'd like to be red cells? Over here. Oh, white cells. Oh, over here. Oh, platelets. And so break them up into the different parts of blood. And then since they're all cells in the blood, they're gonna have to walk the path of cardiac circulation, the way the blood flows. So, oh, okay. And we even labeled each atria, which one it was, which, so, oh, look, I'm in this atria. Now I'm walking through these valves. I'm in this ventricle. Oh, look, I'm going off. What vessel am I taking to the lungs? All right, I'm gonna trade my blue piece of paper for a red piece of paper, unoxygenated blood for oxygenated. And then I'm, oh, what's taking me back to the heart? Look, which atria am I in? Which valve, which vessel? And I'm going off to the body in, in which vessel. So it was a walk the path of cardiac circulation. So I came back uh, later that year. I taught her initially in July, and then I came back in November. And I just passed her in the hall. She was like, oh, Michelle, you got you to see this. So she unrolls the sheet. And oh my gosh, the changes she's made are beautiful. Unoxygenated side of the heart is all colored blue, oxygenated red. She's got some Christmas lights, you know, the sparkly kind that just all over the place. She's put those and she goes, look, oh, I put the Purkinje fibers. Oh, look, they're firing. She was so excited. So she had made some, some improvements. And I said, well, uh, how did it go teaching circulation of the heart? And she said, well, this is a whole new class. And it took me 10 minutes to teach it because they all walked it. And then I stopped them at points and said, so what about this? And what about that? And they learned it much better than when I was lecturing about it because they were walking the path of cardiac circulation. So I share that with you. You don't have to be an artist. You can actually, if you can draw at all, or if you have any kind of basic uh, picture of cardiac circulation, you can take it to a banner store and have them made a banner out of it that's plasticized that can last you for years and years and years and years and years. Now, another group of people in South Carolina were teaching how muscles work using a handful of uncooked spaghetti. Boy, did I love that one. Just the whole package of spaghetti and how you can turn it this way and the muscles do not tear because that's the way muscle fibers run. They run horizontally, just like the spaghetti do. Boy, was that fun. She had tied up with rubber bands and used the spaghetti to teach 
the muscle she was teaching. And then the other one that I thought was really pretty amazing and I've seen done more than once is, if you have the students bring in a t-shirt, an old t-shirt, it doesn't matter what's on the t-shirt. They turn the t-shirts inside out to the side that has no printing on it, right? It's inside out. And you give them fabric markers. And for their homework, what they have to do is they have to draw the anatomy of what's under the t-shirt. So where would the, the lungs be? Where would the heart be? Where would the bones of the chest be? Where would the shoulder be? They have to draw on that t-shirt the parts of the anatomy. Okay, so this is good. They take it home, they do that. Front and back, just as if it's the front of the patient, the back of the patient. Then when they bring it back to class, you can have people stand in line and with a pretend stethoscope or a real one, they can be listening to breath sounds on the person in a line in front of them. They can be, oh, where does it go? Oh, here, 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 based on the, the anatomical drawing that they've all made on their t-shirts. I have seen t-shirt drawing in those two steps where first they draw it and it's accurate and then they actually have to interact with it like they did with a low fidelity mannequin. Kind of interesting, but they're on everybody's shirts. So it's okay, oh, let me assess the shoulder here, the shoulder socket, whatever. Those three I, all, I learned all from the health science educators in South Carolina um, several years ago. So who else would like to share one more before I'm finished? Oh, Laura shared a file. Yay, thank yeah, you, Laura. I, I am Laura and I live in Niagara Falls, New York and I've been teaching about four years. Oh, wow. um, and my students really like using masking tape on the floor. We have rugs, but we use them on the rugs and they create, that's what that picture is if it came up. It's actually the circulatory system on the floor and they color it in with the tape in the direction things are rolling and they put arrows. They love doing that. And it stays up all year long. Yeah. Can you so see it, it? Can everybody see it? How cool that is? Yes. I can't find a finished picture, but that's um, they they usually decorate the person to be somebody, and every year they come up with something different. Wow. It's a lot of fun. How wonderful is that? Oh, Laura, big applause from all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, be cheered on. You know, best practices are the best things to share. And I know that your organization is good at doing that. I know that it's important. Let me find my, where I need to be. I know it's important that we share those kinds of things. So we'll come back to our crucial educators. Here we go. All right. So I was just saying ideas won't work unless you do. So it's important for us always to be trying new ideas for us to be able to take it to another level. So far today, what's the best teaching idea you've gained? Just so far today, what is it? Give everybody a chance to either go into the text. It could be anything from any of your peers, Anything I've talked about, anything you've done that's yet to be discovered or shared with everybody? So we'll see what comes up here. Well, I'm glad somebody likes to stand up, sit down since I unplugged everything doing it. So that's good. Yes. Here's B. Richard Simmons.
So while this is happening, you know, one thing that I've learned from technology is the students are way, way ahead of me in technology. So sometimes I'll encourage them to create a meme or create a 60 to 90 second video commercial about the content that I'm teaching them or that I've given them as an assignment. You should see the wonderful products of what people have created over diabetes, what people have created over um, the benefits of exercise, the videos and the crazy memes that they've created that I wouldn't even begin to think of. Because when your students love technology, they know how to use it easier than you and I do and indeed can benefit from that. So I just have to toss that in about, because I didn't even know what a meme was, but the students do, and they sure are good at creating them. So I'll let you continue here while we're watching our, our peers and what they have to say. Now, again, at the end of time, when we're finished today, I, uh, Mentimeter.com is gonna allow me to save all of the things that you've put into here with mine. And I am going to be able to indeed share that with the organization so you can have these slides as well. So that they're all together. Oh, good, yeah, the Ask It Basket's a good one as well. So now, what questions do you have? They can be big questions. They can be small questions. They can be middle-sized questions. But I'd like for you, you know, a built-in time here for you to raise whatever questions you have. Not only am I here, but there's probably way over 400 years of experience of instructors here with us online that can help us to meet some of the challenges we've had. Or if you have any questions about what I've suggested or what I've brought up, you can put it here in Mentimeter, you can put it in the chat, you can put it wherever you want it to be. Let's see how well I am doing as a teacher since I'm fairly new and coming from pharmacy. And when you mention things, I think, oh, wow, I do that. Yay, yay, <laughs> that's a good thing. Time for questions. Remember, you're in the role of your students, but not the ones who are like, okay, don't ask any questions because then you know we can move on. No, now's the time to, to ask the questions that maybe have come up here. Do any of you have suggestions for helping ESL students in pre-nursing? Okay. There's the first question. You know, I'm going to back out of Menti and I'm gonna show you my favorite way of teaching things. Okay. And then we'll get to icebreaker ideas. Hang on. I want to show you a method you could use to teach anything to anyone, no matter whether English is their first or second language. I just need to open up something to show it to you. Stuff it, I don't want stuff it guide. Hang on folks, I'm gonna stop my share. I'm gonna figure out what's going on here on my laptop and show you a method. So it says their first day icebreakers. I can give you a fast one and I can give you a slow one. Trivia is a good fast one. A good slow one is commonalities and uniquenesses. What I ask people to do is to come up with what's one thing they all have in common 
I put them in small groups of like five or six. What's one thing they all have in common that's not obvious or boring? It couldn't be we brush our teeth. It would have to be we all use the same brand of toothpaste. Something they all have in common and then each person has to come up with a unique thing about them that's not true for anybody else in the group. So when I did this most recently, I had a group of people, uh, a girl was named after her father, and it was an unusual name that people were having trouble remembering. And she was like, well, it was named after my father. Somebody else uh, had just returned from a trip overseas, it was a mission trip. So uniquenesses come out as well as commonalities. And so that's one that takes a little bit more time. There's a long one, there's a short one. Bingo cards, yes. Ask a question on the card, ooh, what a good one. All right, let me get to my favorite method for people using any language. There we go. Mm. getting there all right anybody want to unmute and talk that's a good thing too questions concerns i'm trying to find something to show here since we're not together and i can't just oh, maybe i can one more I gave a scavenger hunt for the icebreaker this year and just wrote down the areas, kind of made some catchy little um, sayings. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but you know, what area of the school would you go to if you cut your finger or I don't know. Needed oh. And then I did not go with my, I have 11th and 12th grade high schoolers. I did not go with them. They're big kids. They can find these places on their own. And uh, they had to take their cell phone with them and take a selfie next uh -huh. to each area and then bring it back to me. Oh, cool. That's how they learned where things were in the school. And then when they got back, I had a, I saw on Pinterest, which is my best friend, uh -huh. a, a big uh, beach ball. And I put variety of questions. What color is your toothbrush? I mean, just simple things. And then we tossed it around the room and got to know each other that way. Wow, thank you. Okay, so remember I said I was trying to find something to show you? You can create a grid with simple pictures so that you can have certain content you hang on this grid. So I've driven here, this is like a tic-tac-toe board. Can you see it? It's like a tic-tac-toe board. So here would be my first picture. And what I do is I'd say, okay, you know, if you look at somebody and they're not looking so good, like they're not feeling well, they might have their tongue hanging out. They may be a real funny color. See the tongue's hanging out. Oh, I'm not feeling good. They might look like, oh no, help me. So if you look at somebody and they don't appear to be feeling good, can you see that on the whiteboard? There's a picture. What do you do? Well. What I'd want to do is I would want to, let me come to a letter. I would want to ask them the question, are you okay? Are you all right? Are you choking? Do you have some problem? So what I'd put here is a text box that would have a big question mark in it. There we go. Not a big question mark, but in my example, okay. So I have a question mark, I'd ask them, hey, are you feeling okay? What's good? If not, then if they couldn't breathe, I'd have to assess what's going on. So in each box, each of the tic-tac-toe boxes, I have a picture that signals to people what that particular process would be. So if I have somebody where English is a second language, not only do they have words that they can put in the boxes, but they have pictures that they can put in the boxes. So that's what I do when English is a second language. Now, let me come back to the questions that were coming up um, on Menti, because I took that down. What was the question on Menti? Icebreakers for all day. Is there a best place to get scenario-based questions? Oh. Oh my gosh, there are so many scenario-based questions in the world that the textbook people have out. I personally have been through, I mean, there are hundreds, if not thousands 
of scenario-based questions that are affiliated with whatever textbook distributor you have, whether that's Lippincott, whether that's Elsevier, whether that's, if, if you go into the instructor resources that come with those books, you'd be amazed at how many ones that they have there. So that would be my suggestion. See what they give you. Let's see if there's any more questions here on Menti. Okay, let's look at the chat. What questions do we have in the chat? Questions, questions. Ooh, there's an app called Goose Chase, online scavenger hunt with taking pictures. Is that what you had used, the person who was talking about that, or were you just using regular? No. You hadn't used No, I made, I made up my own. I didn't know about that. Thank wow. you. Wow, let's all write that down. Goose Chase. Sounds wonderful. Something that's popular right now in the medical field uh, for teaching is escape rooms. Have any of you done escape rooms for your students where they have to figure out an answer that when they figure out the answer, it takes them to the next question. And when they figure out that answer, it takes them to the next question. Cause that's the next big thing that's going on with creative approaches to teaching. Um, I don't know, Has any, have any of you used escape rooms? Breakout EDU, is that escape room stuff? Yep. Nice. And you know, it teaches them to think critically because they have to think through. Yes, Teachers Pay Teacher has many of them. Ah, somebody learned how to make them this summer. Oh, nice. Nice, nice, nice. Created too, says Alyssa. So have you found your students like them? Alyssa, can you unmute and just, just tell us your experience of it? Possibly. Krista did a virtual and a live escape one. Somebody unmute and tell me what your students think of escape rooms. Okay, I'm here. Okay, <laughs> it all took right. me a second. It's okay. Um, yes, I created two and I, I did them in PowerPoint. Uh -huh. um, you just start by copying and pasting pictures over you can use um, remove.bg to remove backgrounds from objects uh -huh. um, to put in there. And then you just create hot links to um, questions, Google Forms with questions. I, um, I have one, I called it my surgical escape room that I did for my health science too for infection control. And um, I actually made it their test. So they would click different hot links like the surgical bed or the surgical lights. Um, I put a crash cart in there. I put a supply cabinet. And the whole idea is they eventually work their way through it until they go out the ER doors. Um, oh. And so each little item had about five questions on a Google form that they would answer. Um, and then I would collect their answers, see what they got right, and give them a grade. And, nice. then, and they loved it. They thought it was a great way to take a test. OK, yeah. I'm not going to unplug everything. Stay there. I have to grab a prop. Hold on. Since you were talking surgical, I just have to show you the latest thing that I'm using to teach surgical stuff. They make these people cutouts in all different uh, skin tones and different, uh, I have a female right here. I have some that appear to be just male, plano. And so what I tell my learners is, I said, okay, we're gonna talk about positioning of a patient. So we have uh, a face, put a face on one side. Okay, now show me what is prone. So everybody put your patient in the prone position. Okay, let's put your patient in the supine position. Okay, let's say we have to put our patient in lithotomy position. What is that gonna be like? And I have them all shape the patients. Oh, okay, this is lithotomy. All right, now we're gonna do jackknife. What does jackknife look like on a bit? So I have them doing the different surgical positions 
using the cutout people. And also when they, you know, to get into more depth, what would the, the positions of, of pressure be with somebody in jackknife? What would, what would we be concerned with? What would happen to circulation in the legs? What if the patient had this or that? Do have any of you used just cu cutouts of people? I, I first saw these at a teacher supply store. I'm sure it was for a bulletin board or something, but I ordered mine online and I have them in different sizes and shapes and in background colors. So I just had to grab some that I was, I was using this week with cut out people for surgery. So again, anything we can put in their hands, anything that will give them the experience. Sure, they could move each other around. Sure, they could. But also, just to reinforce or make it a little safer at first before we have a real human, you could do it with people cutouts. So let me just do a tiny bit about educational risk. What is educational risk and why am I talking about that? Well, the highest level of anxiety and learner risk is when I'm in a class and without any warning, I just call out somebody's name and tell them stand up and answer it. So, okay, all right, Judy, stand up and tell us the meaning of life. Ah! student has no idea what's going on highest level of risk it makes everybody nervous it makes them upset they stand up they're embarrassed no not such a good thing so how do we bring educational risk down well a better way you all know this is to present the question to everybody okay what's the meaning of life and then seek volunteers who would like to answer that okay take a shot at it. all right that makes it safer what makes it even safer still what takes the level of educational risk down? And that is putting people in collaborative groups, saying to the group, here's the question, what's the meaning of life? Now, have a two minute discussion, keep your answers, and then I'll hear from each group. What does this group, what's the meaning of life? What's it? it lowers the risk to the learners. So if you and I have some people that we're teaching who've had a time in their life when they've struggled for whatever reason in a classroom, bringing down the level of educational risk to the safest level I was just talking to you about gets the people who've had bad experiences in the past, not from us, but from someone else. It helps to bring their comfort level up and their level of anxiety down. I know we all intuitively know this, but until I heard it defined in a formal lecture and read about it, I didn't realize that what I was taking for granted just happened. Because not every teacher has seen lowering the level of educational risk modeled when they were in school. Maybe, you know, I was in school a long time ago. Man, it was lots of educational risk. It was intimidate the students. That's not the way the world is now. Collaborative learning is very, very helpful, lowers the level of risk, and indeed can get those who have anxiety to calm down and know that we're not going to just randomly make them stand up in front of everyone and be embarrassed. Yeah, look, okay, Ann's saying terrified in nursing school. Oh my gosh, I went to nursing school at a terrifying time too. And when I went to nursing school, it was this, never ask a question. Because if you asked a question, <laughs> it, was, it was against all rules. You couldn't ask a question. You were supposed to know these things. And if you didn't know these things, well, then that was your problem. I had some tough, tough, tough people, but I'm hoping never to be that. So yes, I learned every I, very little in school. I learned as a nursing assistant. Yes, I was a nursing. First, I was a candy striper. Then I was a nursing assistant. <laughs> then I was a nurse. And so then I'm an, now I'm an educator. There you go. We move up. So fear is not a motivator that any of you want. I know we want to take people on the journey. When they experience joy and positive emotion as part of us teaching them, it does such good things. The first thing it does is it moves the information up into long-term memory because memory and emotion are both in the same part of the midbrain. And when you and I have an experience of emotion, be it good or bad, it moves that information up into long-term memory. However, if everyone we teach hates us, 
we're not going to be doing education very long. So can we indeed make the process of learning joyful and fun because it does cement the learning in and long-term memory faster and easier than just repetition, 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 repetition. So just a little proof of this. How many of you can remember one good thing that happened to you in your life? You won't have to say what it is, but you can remember it. And if I can see your face, just wave at me. If not, wave at, the, at your phone or at the monitor. Okay, good. Remember something good. All right. Can you remember something terrible, some terrible day, some terrible event? You say to yourself, please, I hope this never happens again. Raise a hand. Let's see. Yes, indeed. Never want it to happen. Okay. Now, how many of you can remember what bananas cost per pound in April of 2011? Anybody? No, we don't remember that. Because the first two I asked you about were related to emotion, positive or negative emotion. Oof moves up into long-term memory easily. Cost of bananas per pound, there's no emotion. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just uh -huh. So how would we get that into our brain? We'd have to drag it in over and over, over and over, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. We'd have to do that. So what's the more efficient way to learn and teach people is with them feeling emotion. Moves up into long-term memory. Why do you think all of us remember the first patient we ever took care of who died? Because that, emotional experience moves it into memory. So think about, you don't want your classes to be not good, not bad, just eh, same old, same old, that's the cost of bananas. What we want, what we want is our students to have a positive experience because they're gonna remember the content faster and easier. And because you and I are gonna create the people that take our places, the places in healthcare that need to be filled the places in teaching healthcare that need to be filled. You're touching the future here, folks. This is so incredibly important. I've read that we need to sit with an emotion for 90 seconds to affect positively on our brain. I would agree with that. I would agree with that completely. So what other questions do we have before we move to the next little piece of this, before my time is up? Please, now's the time for questions. And if you have a question that you don't want to ask in front of everybody, I'm gonna put my contact information up. Although I know at least two people have my phone number so they can send me their prize information, 504-914-1400. Please, 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 if I can ever help you, if there's any questions that you have after we're done about anything we talked about, I'd be more more than pleased as punch to talk to you in the future or to visit with you and share my experience. So let me see if there's any more questions here. Okay, let's see where we are. Yep, so before we do this, I'd like to stop and I'd like for you virtually to applaud. So come on, let's just all applaud, yay. We're gonna applaud the, the fact that on a Saturday together, we're learning. We're gonna applaud the fact that we're supporting each other in our efforts. We're gonna applaud the fact that Nancy and all of the people involved with this organization are not only sharing best practices with us, but they plan this day for us. I'd like to applaud that you invited me here, Nancy. I'd like to applaud the fact that I'm a little bit early so that you can get your uh, educators here who are sharing the best practices at the end uh, in a, a, a tiny bit earlier. But I'd like to do this particular closing because it's a kinesthetic closing. So I'm not gonna unplug any, any of my, my stuff, I'm not. But I'm gonna ask each and every one of you to do this activity with me. Here's the first one, stand up. Come on, stand up. Everybody stand. Now, I want you to rotate 360 degrees around. Okay, we're good. Now, I want you to pledge allegiance. I want you to put your hand on your chest. All right, good. And now I want you to wave your hands. Yay, wave your hands, wave your hands. Okay, good, now you can have a seat. You can have a seat because we did those four things together. 
We stood, we rotated, we pledged, and we waved arms. So when you think of your year this year, I hope today it brought you to your feet, it turned you around, it touched your heart, and it made you celebrate your very best ever year, best year ever together, which each and every one of us. So I applaud you, yay, yay, very much applaud. And I'm gonna see if Nancy and her team is ready. And if anybody else wants to share a great idea, I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat, indeed. Put my email address. Anybody else have a great idea they've used, they've heard about, they've seen modeled? Now would be a good time to share that. Michelle, you know, one thing that um, I did as an icebreaker this year, and we are going to be using it kind of throughout the first couple of weeks, is I did guess who cards. So I gave them all index cards. I wrote 10 questions up on the board and I said, choose five, you know, like whatever five questions you want to answer, write the question and the answer, put your name on the top. I'm going to collect them. We'll read two to three a day or, you know, uh, when we meet and as a class, we'll try and guess and see who it is. And it's great for the mixed um, grade level classes that don't already know each other even like all juniors, because they haven't had that group. And even my seniors that have been with me for three years, absolutely loved it. And we're trying to guess and want to do them all the first day. I'm like, no, we're going to space these out. So now <laughs> they have, you know, as I'm taking role and our things are changing the first couple of days, I just pull them out. We add the new people in. I filled out cards too for each one of my classes. So it was fun. Um, Laura, I see your question. It was things like, what is your favorite color? What is your favorite comfort food? Um, what's your favorite dessert? And then um, I did put on there too. I want dot, dot, dot. And I made sure it's school appropriate. It's <laughs> like, <laughs> so it must be school appropriate. But, you know, I learned um, one of my new friends in my class. I was like, oh, I've never heard of this book. Tell the class about the book a little bit. Um, you know, or, oh, I've never seen that TV show. What is it about? What kind of things? So those are um, some good things that helps you get to know the students and they get to know each other too. So that's one thing that's really good. So Karen, I have a question. Yes. Did you put any in for you? I did. I did one and I answered um, not the same questions for each class because I've got students in each one of my classes like that overlap. So I did um, things that maybe they hadn't heard me talk about, like my favorite comfort food or things, you know, my favorite TV show, maybe they don't know. I put five questions on there and we'll see if they can get those answers. Well, good, good. I bet they love that. They do. They All three of the classes have really enjoyed going through those cards so far. Very nice. Thank you, Karen. Yay, yay. And I'm not sure. Um, I know Nancy's on. She may have yeah. stepped away. Yeah. From just no, to... I'm there. Here she is. Are you here? <laughs> here she <laughs> is. Well, so, I know football season hasn't started, so Clemson. Yes, no, I'm here. I'm definitely here. <laughs> well, but well, before you before you jump in, Nancy, let me just talk about a brush with fame because I don't know how many of you have done that one. That's one of my favorite ones. Mm -hmm. I say to them, "Have you ever seen someone live and in person who might have a recognizable name? It could be the mayor, the governor, a state, local, or national politician, or maybe it's an athlete or a sports star." or somebody who's an actor or an actress or somebody you've seen at a distance, have you ever had a brush with fame? And I have people share those with each other. Now, what's interesting is I tell them, this would be in your personal life, not professional life. Brush with fame, have you? And for a minute, you'd be amazed some of the people who have crossed paths with some of the people you're teaching from the local person who does the weather on the TV 
to the mayor or to somebody who was a former president, people have some really interesting stories. And the students really get into that. And then at the end of it, I say this, why are we talking about a brush with fame? Well, you know, in healthcare, it's okay for us to talk about a brush with fame in our personal life, but never a professional life because of HIPAA, 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 HIPAA. And how much will I spend in fines if I break HIPAA up to 100,000 per incident? How long will I spend in jail? Up to 10 years, yes, indeed. So at the end of a brush with fame, I like to roll it into HIPAA and what it means to be a medical professional and how you don't ever get to tell those stories and the consequences if you do, and all about privacy and confidentiality. So since you said that about the questions, Karen, those are so nice, but I just, I had to toss in brush, brush with fame. I'm sorry, Nancy. I just- Can I, can I say one thing too? Yeah. Um, I didn't think to share it in here earlier, but I do a gratitude journal with the kids every day, but I do it electronically. So we use Google Classroom. Okay. And I taught virtually for a year and a half. So if you do that, what I actually do is make a, weekly gratitude slide i am grateful for they have to put on their their um the date what they're grateful for and a picture of something uh -huh. and i have learned so much about my kids and they share so much with me we do this every day the whole year um it's a lot of work to put it together but it was it's one of the my favorite things that i've figured out how to do um and it teaches them and also all to look at things from a positive perspective which is wow. sort of needed right now. So just, a, it just, I could, anyway. Laura, it give just, Laura a hand. No, it's so important because kids feel so isolated nowadays. And we hear about how so many of them are struggling with anxiety and, you know, the downside of, of social media attack, et cetera. What a wonderful thing to do. So you give them a positive saying to start with right i give them i i make a main slide and i do these myself and they can see mine okay. i post them on google classroom so right. they can look at mine but they can edit their own okay on theirs they write i am grateful for and they pick something i don't care the color red i don't care what <laughs> and then they have to take a picture or an icon or they take pictures of each other i'm grateful for my friend and they take a picture and put it on there i don't care what they do it's the act of doing it every day that creates a habit and a way of looking at the world. Um, so that's what they do daily. I, I can show you at some other point. If you're those, are, those are terrific, Laura. Thank you for, for, uh, Sorry for making that specific for me. Thanks. Yay. I would hey, like Nancy, I'll be quiet now. I would like to share something that I started this year um, I wish I, my, I'm Kim Pate and I teach the pharmacy program in Florida and it's a four year program. So when my kids come in to me as freshmen, I have them for all four years. And so I wish that I would have started this four years ago, but I did it. <laughs> um, I have them write a letter to themselves. And then at the end of those four years, I mean, I'm going to do it every year when they come into me at the end of those four years, they can open those letters and see how they've changed and um, how much they've matured and grown and just some things. And I, you know, they were like, well, what do we write about? And, you know, so I gave them some ideas and, um, but I thought that that would just be a really good way for them to kind of track themselves since I do have them for all four years. Very nice. Give a hand. Yay. Can I piggyback on that real quick? I, I was working with a group of um, LPN instructors and their program is 18 months and it's pretty intense. It's quick. There's lots to go through. So what they did the last week of school is they had the people who are graduating write a letter to the new student who was gonna come in and sit at their desk. And they put it in an envelope and they sealed it and they taped it to the top of the desk. And so when the new students got there, they had a letter from someone they had never met, but somebody who had just been through a pretty intense 18 month program with words of encouragement and little secrets of things that they would advise them to do. So again, that wisdom is so important. What a great maturing thing that you're talking about over time. and then. I just wanted to toss that in because then the students can benefit from each other's advice. 
thank you, Michelle. We appreciate you um, so much. I know that everyone who has joined us today understands exactly why we invited you to be our keynote today. And we also know that people will benefit from this who have an opportunity to go back and watch the archive version. So we appreciate you allowing us to video it and um, it will be impactful to teachers for many, many months to come. We are gonna finish up the last 30 minutes hearing from some of our um, officers who are also classroom teachers, just like you. And our first speaker is Michelle Sparks. And she's going to talk about HOSA Camp and a name game that she uses. Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Sparks. I'm from North Carolina, just outside of Winston-Salem. I teach at Career Center High School. So I'm at a high school that has students coming in from eight different schools within our county. So the students who come in to see me, I only get them their junior and senior years. And they've, well, I only get them their juniors. Um, I'm an athletic trainer. So I teach for in North Carolina, Health Science 1 and 2, which Health Science 1 is all the body systems and the diseases that can impact those systems. And then Health Science 2 is kind of in, intro to all things health careers. So when I give them their, their junior years, they've never met these students coming in from these seven other high schools that are coming to, to be a big group within my classroom. So one of the first things that we do is and I've gotten a lot of really good ideas for, for the icebreakers as we've talked through. But one of the first things I do that very first day is name game. Because number one, I don't know them. And number two, they don't know each other. So with having that name game the very first day, and it's, I don't know if it's a teacher skill or what, but I've become very good with names. So if we play this name game the very first day, by the second day, I know their names and I'm able to greet them at the door by name as they come into my classroom. And I'm, I'm, our, our theme this year at my school is positive on purpose. And that kind of fits me to a T because I am a positive person. I'm smiling all the time. And I like to, to promote that positivity in my classroom and everywhere else. Um, so the first, there are a couple and I've seen them in the chat. I saw Mackenzie, you said about the toilet paper game. And I've played that a lot. I was a Girl Scout doing camp all growing up. And the toilet paper game was one of the ones we did. If you're not familiar with that, um, you tell your students you're going on an overnight camping trip and they need to take the amount of toilet paper they would need for that one night trip. And some of them are going to take a whole lot of toilet paper. Some of them have played the game before and they're going to take like two squares. And so then they, they break the toilet paper up into squares. And for each square of toilet paper they have, they have to say something about themselves. That one doesn't help me quite as much with the names. So the one that I normally do is I get the students out of their desk. We set up the room in chairs in a circle and I'm, I'm at the first and then students are going around the room. And so we have an adjective. They're going to come up with their first name or with me. It's my last name. So I'm always silly sparky. That's that's what I go by. And so I'm silly sparky. The person next to me does theirs. And what they do is they say theirs and then they say mine. So as we're going around the room, they say their name and their adjective and the person before them coming back to me. So then at the very end, because we're in a circle, so the last person's going to go and then I go again at the very last. And so at the very last I go and I do all the names. And just, just going through that activity with the three classes that I teach because we're on a block schedule. I've, I've learned their names. There are a couple that I normally miss. I have at most 25 students in my class. Um, there are a couple that, that I, they still have to remind me. Um, but for the most part, I would say 95% of the names I have by, we start school on Monday, so I would have by Tuesday, um, which makes them really comfortable because then Tuesday they come in the room and I'm like, good morning, Glenda, how are you doing today? And, and so they feel very welcome in my classroom as soon as they walk in the door because I've greeted them by name on the very second day of school. Um, I was trying to, I did not tell you, I, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget and I forgot anyway. Um, my role within the Health Science Educators Association is that I'm on the Professional Development Committee. Misty and I, I believe, are tag teaming on getting some professional development, specifically working toward those 
webinars that are coming in the fall. Um, so those are the two name games that I have really spent the most time working with because that was kind of my topic was name games. And um, Tracy, you mentioned the beach ball with the numbers. I've done that one a lot, just kind of as random review. Um, there's, you put a beach ball and I've got numbers one through a hundred on the beach ball. We throw it around the room. The person who catches it puts their whatever number their right thumb is on. I have a list of questions and I ask that question and they answer it. If they don't know, they can phone a friend. Um, but I, I got at probably at HOSA or at the last NISHI conference I went to, got a beach ball for free and I just put those numbers all over it and that was that was a game. So let me see. Nancy, I was really excited when you said Seattle. I didn't know, I didn't know we were going there. I had to sign up for that one. Um, but so then the second part of mine is on our NISHI webinars from the spring, there is a HOSA camp. It was a webinar that we did on March 23rd and Nancy Harris out of Oklahoma did that webinar. And um, here in North Carolina, we have regional. So Amanda told Amanda talks a lot about HOSA. Um, here in North Carolina, our, our HOSA is divided into regionals and then we have state. So we have our state leadership conference and this year it's gonna be April, but we have regional leadership conferences in November to kind of help control the numbers that go to state. And what my, uh, my regional is on November 5th. So I will get my students on August 29th. And then I have to, they have to have picked a, an event and be ready to compete by November 5th. So that gives them about two months. So it's really fast. And a lot of the events, medical terminology, just knowledge tests, that's easy for me to tell students about. But there are also student, there are also group events. And some of them I don't even know about. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Um, there are group events that students just aren't familiar with. So the, the host of camp, the webinar that she did, she put her students into groups over the first two weeks of school and they were going through the different competitive events, especially the group events. So the students can learn a little bit more about those events before they have to pick what event they want to compete in and commit to it. Um, there was something else I was thinking. Uh, oh, oh, okay. And one, one of the things and I think everybody in, in the NISHI when we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, I told them in my school, we are discouraged from starting curriculum for the first 10 days of school. They're doing a lot of drop ad and moving students all around. So they, they want us to do other things. So when I, when I did this webinar back in the spring, I was like, that's an awesome thing for me to do during the first two weeks, since they don't want me to do curriculum anyway. And I can introduce my students to HOSA and really get them excited about competing, not only at the regional, but at the state level. Okay, well, thank you um, so much, Melissa. I just pulled this up. So if you go to healthscienceconsortium.org and then there's a tab across the top that says webinars and then you can, uh, it says watch past webinars and then you'll be able to see uh, the array of topics that have been presented since we started doing this about three years ago. I appreciate you taking us there, Melissa, so that we could remind people how to get to that. Okay, our next speaker is Lou Ann Lively, and he's going to talk to us about, I'm not sure why I'm echoing. Go ahead, Lou Ann. Okay, I am Lou Ann. Uh, I'm from Durant, Oklahoma. Uh, can you hear me, Andy? Okay. Thank you. And I teach health science. It's the beginning of the health career field in our comprehensive high school. I teach mainly ninth graders and ninth graders are the worst about understanding the importance of turning in homework, grades, credits and classes, transcripts, the whole nine yards. So um, for the past 20, this is my 24th year that I'm starting to teach. 
and it's always a struggle. They are used to being in middle school and the middle school teachers begging them to turn in their homework, like pleading with them. I'm like, you, you're up now, you're an adult, so you have to learn how to take on the responsibilities of turning your in your homework. Um, I try to have them set goals about coming to school, turning in their work, but how important a credit is in order to graduate. So I didn't, I can't take credit for this homework plan. There was a teacher a couple of years ago that came in and I had an uh, encore class. I'm kind of like a home teacher for a group of kids for four years. And they brought in saying that they were having to fill out. And she even, it was a science class and she gave 100 points credit daily work weekly if they turned us in. And they weren't turning it in. I'm like, they're giving you 100 extra points. You're not turning in this work. So um, after this past school year, out of 279 freshmen in our class, 19 of them completely filled in ninth grade. And I think that number is terrible. So I am, again, this year implementing, no, just put up here. I know you can't see it very well, but it's called a homework planner. And Nancy's going to give you a copy of it. It is a chart, a table, whatever you want to call it. It is a weekly type planner. Um, I'm going to give it to my encore kids, really all my classes right now, <clears throat> and give them bonus, uh, bonus points for when they do this. So they have to fill it out every class period, Monday through Friday, first through seventh hour, um, what their homework is. And then when I get my encore kids fifth hour, or after fifth hour, we're going to go through their planner and do all their homework so they don't have to take homework home. Again, I think it's important that you start the very first day of school with this planner so that they know what you expect from them. And so um, I think that's going to help them. I'm hoping it is. Uh, with all my classes, we're going to do it for four weeks so that they get them in a routine of doing this. And so um, when you get your packet, Nancy's going to send that to you. If you want to fix it a different way, that is great. At the bottom, it says that um, you're responsible for writing down your assignments every day that you have for class. If there's no homework in that space, write NH for no homework so you don't forget to write something down. So I think it's I think it's important that they start taking accountability for their own stuff. And that's all I've got. So I hope you have a good day. So far, so good. Thank you so much, Luann. I, I'm married to an educator and came from industry like many of you. And I remember him telling me, you have to give them homework on the first day. You have to. You can lighten up as you go, but you got to do it. So um, I liked it when you said you do it on the first day and we'll get that out to them. It'll be in a, um, a Word document that they can make it their own. And so we'll send that out to attendees. Our next Thank person you. is Lissa Bartle, and she's coming to us from Florida. So with that, Lissa's going to speak to us about case studies. All right. Well, uh, good good afternoon, I guess it is now. <laughs> Feeling a little, this has been great. I'm so excited. Um, I am talking about case studies. Yes. Yeah, so one of the, uh, I um, teach also in a comprehensive high school. We are a medical magnet program, have students from ninth through 12th grade and our ninth graders take anatomy and physiology. And then when I get them again by the, or get them when they're 12th graders, they're learning their certification class, but they don't remember anything about anatomy and pathology. So I'm starting out the year with a quick synopsis of that. My students are teach, um, getting their medical assisting certification. So they really need to understand body planes and cavities and a little bit about diagnoses, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the ways that I am going to do that, and um, I do have the documents to share with you guys when... Um, uh, at the end, these will be in a file or whatever for you, however that's going to happen. Um, so we've started out with just doing some basic labeling of the muscular system. We just did a thing on uh, body 
planes and cavities and directions and they didn't remember any of that and um I did an antiquated way of doing the mannequins and I just put numbers on the mannequins and had them identify the body directional terms but now I'm excited because I got this QR code idea um and I want to run with that so one of um, and then I want to introduce um, case studies for them, just very easy to do case studies, um, hopefully progressing up into a little bit harder ones to develop their critical thinking skills. So this case study is actually, um, if you have not heard of or used purposeful pedagogy before, um, I use a lot of her uh, information or her uh, uh, things that she does and doesn't give her a plug. Maybe she's on here. I don't know. Um, uh, but so this one was one from uh, a um, uh, module that she had created. So in looking at this, we're just going to go through here. I also last year I had the same group of students in what's called allied health and they got their administrative assisting certification. So I know we went over soap notes, so uh, want them to remember about how to document subjective and objective findings. And then as we move through our curriculum, as it gets more complex, then I can talk to them about, you know, reading an EKG and, you know, what labs are going to be drawn and all of that. But for the first part, this, you know, at the beginning of school, just getting them to think again, trying to get them to think critically. So we're since we're starting with the skeletal muscular system, um, you know, we're just have them read through the scenario and try and figure out, you know, what would the diagnosis be? We actually are using the um, suggested diagnoses from the Nishi supplements. So, uh, um, so they just have some basic ones. You know, what are, what are the different types of fractures? What's a sprain, what's a strain, um, kyphosis, lordosis, those kind of things. So the case studies go along with the pathology that I want them to learn. And then they'll write their subjective and objective findings from that as well. And now that we learned about the um, using the QR codes, now I can put a QR code on a mannequin where the glenohumeral pain is. And now they can scan that and see what that will actually look like. Or um, uh, put a QR code on the patient's mouth and then that will say, oh, my arm feels like it's out of place. And then, okay, what kind of questions, follow-up questions could you ask the patient about that? So that's where I hope to go with this. So you guys will have, um, I just gave you some uh, worksheets in the sample case, but um, here's the credit where you can go and get all the other um, things from that. And then um, uh, the other thing that I wanted to plug is I do want to plug the um, consortium conference that will be here, uh, October 26th through the 28th. Um, and I'm really excited. Uh, the conference is great. I've actually been going to their conferences and Nancy might not even know this, but I've been going to their conferences from uh, very first, like first or second one many, many years ago when it was in Indianapolis and I've just been a supporter ever since then. So if you have it in your budget or can ask for uh, the money to attend the conference, it's well, well worth it. So go guys. Hey, we didn't even, we didn't even pay her to do that. We do. <laughs> We do appreciate that infomercial about the conference. Um, we do that each fall and we'll, like she said, we'll be in Charleston, South Carolina, the number one tourist city in America. And then in October of 2023, we'll be in Seattle. And then we're looking for our location for 2024. So the cool thing about this conference is it's a hundred percent health science. And we know that you all, have opportunities to go to a lot of career and technical 
conferences or professional development opportunities, but sometimes health science is just a part of that. And what makes this conference unique is that every presenter, every exhibitor, all the networking, all the workshops, it's all focused on health science education. So for that, we are very proud. Our last little uh, tidbit from a, a teacher that serves on the leadership team for the health science educators is Misty Morrow. And she is playing in a statewide tennis tournament in Utah. So this is an excused absence for her. And so she did just a five minute little video about team building. So I'm going to attempt to show that to you now. Hi, everybody. My name is Misty Morrow, and I come to you from the great state of Utah. I teach at Kearns High School in the Salt Lake Valley. I teach uh, medical terminology, anatomy, physiology, and sports medicine. I hope that you guys are having a great time at this conference and are learning some amazing things to either continue the start of your amazing year or help you to start your year. I know some have already started and some are about to start. So today I'm going to be focusing on teamwork or team building. The first activity that I generally do on the first day, and if I cannot get to the first day, definitely the second day is this appointment clock. I don't believe in having a seating chart unless I really need to, but generally I don't need to have a seating chart. But students get really comfortable with just working with the people sitting at their table. And it's really sad to me when these students do not build relationships with other students in the classroom and sometimes don't even know each other's name for an entire year that they're spending in my classroom. So to combat that, I do this activity so that they at least get to know 12 other people in my class. So like I said, it's called the appointment clock, as you can see here. I'm going to put my name where it asked me to, and then there are 12 lines representing the time from 12, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth through 11. So what I'm going to have them do is they can get a couple of people who are sitting at their table, but then they also need to move around the classroom and meet other people for a total of 12 other people. So I'm going, how it works is I'm going to find somebody, let's say that I have my three o'clock appointment time open. I'm going to find somebody in the class that also has a three o'clock appointment time open. I'm going to introduce myself to them. Hello, my name is Misty Morrow. And they're going to introduce themselves to me, Tyler Hansen. So I'm going to put Tyler Hansen's name right here on the line at 3 p.m. Then I'm gonna, then we are going to share one fun thing we did this summer with each other. And then we're also going to share a hobby or something we like to do. And whatever hobby that Tyler shares with me or the thing that he likes to do, I'm going to write down here um, at the right next to his name. So when everybody is finished, they should now have 12 different people that they can collaboratively work, collaboratively, sorry, work with through the rest of the year. And if you have super small classes, you can try to adjust this. They might have to sign each other's twice or something. Then I have them all go back to their original seats. And then sometimes if time allows, I will have everybody stand up and introduce to the rest of the class, maybe their two o'clock appointment time or their nine o'clock. So then everybody gets to kind of know each other's name and also share their hobby, or something that they like to do. If you have any questions about this, you can feel free to reach out to me. I'm sure that the conference director can give out all of our information, like our emails, and uh, you should have access to this handout as well. The other thing that I do is I give them a writing prompt when they first walk into my class on the first day, and then they need to pick up this index card. And it can be any size you want, lined or blank. This is a three by five blank index card. The two writing prompts that I have are write in a complete sentence or using two complete sentences, two things that you're looking forward to this year or you're excited about. <laughs> and then on the back side, they have to write one complete sentence about one thing that they're nervous or anxious about for this upcoming school year. I give them a couple minutes to do that. I always have a timer so that they can gauge how long they have left. Then I will have them share 
both sides, the two things that they're looking forward to and the one thing that they're a little bit anxious about with their elbow partner or their table buddy. Give them about a minute to share. Then I will have them get out of their chairs and go form new groups of three to four. And I will give them a few min minutes to share with that. Another extension of this is I could have them, um, well, actually, and then I have them go back to their original seat and then we start sharing as a whole group. And after we start sharing as a whole group, then um, once everybody has had a turn to go, then I can kind of group them up into commonalities, like common things, like different groups of um, things that students are nervous about. And then we can kind of discuss that. And I do this activity to start forming relationships so that the students can get to know each other. And so then I can get to know them and they can get to know me. And I also do the same thing. I will have a card and I will do two things I'm excited about and one thing that I'm nervous or anxious for. And then I will participate in the small group and the whole class while facilitating. I do not, um, going back to the appointment clock, I do not participate in that. I am not going to be, I am not one of the people that can be one of their appointment times. So these are just two things that I do for teamwork or team building. And hopefully one of these is something that you can take run with it, modify it as you see fit, or maybe it just stimulates a light bulb to go off in your mind of some other activity you would like to do. So I hope you have a great conference, have a great weekend, and an amazing start to your school year. Okay, let's see, am I muted? No, I'm not muted, good. All right. Well, how about this day that you've spent maybe four or five hours of a Saturday? Please go to your administration when you see them on Monday or the next time that or when you start school. Let them know about your commitment and show them your certificate of participation for five hours of meaningful professional development that will make you better at what you do. So look for those certificates of participation sometime later at the next week. We'll also send you the handouts as promised. We'll send you the recording. It'll also be archived here under webinars. This is our homepage. Just quickly, webinars. This is where we'll um, put the fall schedule where you can register for those Wednesday webinars, watch past webinars, and this is where today's recording will be posted. I've talked to you a little bit about the National Health Science Standards and that project that we did um, over the spring to look at and refresh and make sure that our standards are current. So this is where um, they'll be posted and it'll also be on the homepage, press release about the revisions that were done and completed in August of 2022. We've mentioned frequently about the conference. I know that um, some of us are shy about asking to go, but for that reason, we've created this request to attend letter so you can go and download it. It's in Word and you can make it your own and it describes the cost there of attending the conference and we're we're doing early bird reg um early bird registration through um, October 1. So you have a little bit of time to get your courage up and ask your administration if they'd like to invest in you. And if you're a new teacher, now is it the exact time to ask because they don't want you to leave and you need to tell them that this is your professional learning community and these are the people that you need to be networking with and connected to. If you scroll down, you can, if you're interested in who's exhibiting, you can, um, we're still accepting exhibitors, but you can see who we have coming so far. And then um, in the near future, we have some information about our keynotes, but we'll also have the workshops there in about probably about three weeks. And um, there was one other thing I was gonna tell you about. Oh, a conference overview. We know that when you submit a proposal or a request to travel, you have to have a conference overview. So it's there. We, we're updating that frequently. So if there's changes, it's there, but the main dates and times obviously 
do not change. Okay, so with that, I just um, wanted to remind you, if you're not a part of the teacher organization, just go here under membership. It's only $45 a year. And we really only had this uh, membership division for four years. And so we are happy to announce that we have over 1,800 members from across the nation. We even have someone from Canada. We have someone from Mexico. And, and this year, we have a new member from Australia. So we're, we're real excited about the impact that we're making. So if you're interested in joining that and having access to, to uh, teachers who do what you do, we invite you to do that. Also, there's a Facebook page. You don't have to be a member of the consortium of the Health Science Educators Association to join our Facebook group. And we have about 2,500 members there of that Facebook group. And the amount of exchange and support and networking and just um, we're just so encouraged how people want to help each other. So I wanted to mention that. Um, wish you all so much success in your upcoming school year and um, look forward to communicating with you and Laura from New York here, who's been a teacher 40 years, I think she said, um, said the Facebook group is has been very, very helpful to her. So how fun is that, that we had teachers from their first year all the way to 39 and 40 years. So it just goes to show that we all can learn something new. So thank you so much. You have, my, I'm going to put, you should have my email address, but if you don't, I'll put it here as, as we're parting and just thank you so much for coming. I hope you've learned something new. Thanks to our leadership team for the teacher organization and also to Michelle Deck. Great job. Okay, happy Saturday, everyone. Lisa, somebody had them. Did you see a message? For, well, so I'm just talking. I think it was maybe a part. Can I get contact information? Um, oh, my contact.